and because uh, we do have a quorum, and I think I do think there are some apologies coming. I'll let Leanne deal with those in a second, but just welcome, councillors. Uh, sorry I missed you all yesterday, and um, welcome to our guests for the public forum. And uh, we'll start off. Apologies, isn't there? I think there's apologies for lateness, for lateness and an apology from Dave for leaving early. That's right, isn't it, Dave? Councillor McPherson? You're leaving early, yeah? Yeah, sorry. Does somebody want to put an apology Has anybody heard anything from the Deputy Mayor? Is there an apology? Um, I heard it yesterday say that he was coming. Okay, all right, well, we'll leave that as it is then. All right, somebody... Um, <laughs> Councillor Bunting, move the apologies be accepted. Councillor Hakas and uh, seconds all in favour. Oh, carried. Confirmation of agenda. There are no changes to the agenda. We have... Um, three people with us for the um, public forum, but um, we'll get to those in a minute. So somebody move that the agenda be as confirmed. Councillor Bunting, Councillor Casson, thank you. All in favour? Uh, de any declarations of interest with the matters on today's agenda? There being none, thank you. Uh, we now move on to our um, guests. And first up this morning, we have Neil from the Western Community Centre. Good morning, Neil. One, two. Uh, good morning. Um, this, I guess uh, thank you for this opportunity to, to present. Um, once upon a time, in a place not too far away, there was a community centre in Norton, Hamilton West, called the Western Community Centre. Since 1979, the centre has been working hard to build thriving, vibrant, healthy and self-reliant communities, working in partnership with the Hamilton City Council, who had been there from the very beginning. Thank you. Each year, from its facilities owned by the community, the community hub has grown its sh space to share with over 130 not-for-profit community groups, clubs, organisations, education providers, churches and schools. These groups make a combined total of over 2,300 bookings every year, and it's open seven days a week, morning, afternoon, through to late at night, which is great. All ages of people enter through the community centre doors, accessing over 90 unique services and programmes with the centre's aim to improve the quality of life for its Hamilton West residents and people across Hamilton. It's diverse. People arrive for support and guidance. For some, it's a place to be and connect with others. For some, it's, uh, it's growing our community champions and leaders. It's a place to brainstorm ideas and initiatives to solve community issues and challenges. For many, it's a place of learning and a stepping stone for further training opportunities and employment. For families, the centre makes home life easier as they know while they're working, their children are being looked after in a safe environment. They also know they can attend a number of key community events in their neighbourhood where costs and transport are not barriers to their children having a great shared positive experience. For a growing number, it's providing opportunities for residents to be actively involved in giving their time back to the neighbourhood. It's a thriving and beautiful place. However, over the last few years, the community sector, including our centre, has been increasingly under threat due to increased demand, having to deal with more complex issues, funding pressures and service gaps through the cuts and changes of delivery models from local and central government. Our community centres across Hamilton are increasingly having to become more focused on survival. These changes are making an impact on the health and well-being of our neighbourhoods, limiting their opportunities and are creating problems and issues for the future. If not addressed, we will see a decline in community pride, frustration for residents, and it will require a greater financial cost and time commitment to repair neighbourhoods. The funding that is received from our ratepayers through Council's multi-year community grant pool is gratefully received, and we believe it is what our ratepayers would advocate for. I believe we deliver tremendous added value and an incredible amount of services to the city. However, over the past decade and more, our centre and many others across Hamilton have not seen any funding increase that has kept up with inflation. Over the next three years, the Western Community Centre will see a decrease of 33,000, which will impact what we can provide. I ask that this council seriously consider increasing the multi-year community grant funding pool 
in its 10-year plan to enable centres like ours to continue to make Hamilton a great place to live in. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Neil. Just one quick question for me. Would you, are you going, going to submit that point of view to the long-term plan, ask that the quantum of the grants be increased? Yes, yeah, we'll do, yeah. Okay, thank you very yep. much. Councillor Mallett. Um, how is the, you, you, your demand's increasing, but how is, is the demand changing? Why well, are you getting different people or different um, needs coming to your theatre than, uh, your theatre? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a your whole mix of reasons. Centre. Um, I think it's, it's the lack of space for community groups to use, so they're, they're coming to us. I think it's, um, I guess it's part of our success. So give us an example of, of the community groups who, who haven't got space that need to come in. Um, it could be anywhere from Progress to Health, it could be um, your Tai Chi groups, it could be government agencies, it could be uh, training, people providing training opportunities, um, council comes out to us, there's 130 of them and I can send you a list. Um, it's 130 what? Different kind of groups. Oh, okay. So if we added up all the groups, that's what the total is every year. These are people using your facility, yeah, using yeah. that facility. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Groups. yeah. Groups. Yeah. Groups. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Councillor McPherson. Yeah, I'm just trying to get a handle, Neil, on the um, change in, in grants over the years. Uh, in the last five years, has the grant been stable or going up or going down, or what's ha happened? Uh, the last three years, it went up a, a, a couple of thousand dollars, but it, you know, since um, I think 2004, it's remained pretty much the same. 2004, so yeah. for 15, 14 years, it's yeah. It's uh, been 2004. I'm pretty sure it was around 70,000, and you know, I, th I think we're providing a real good value, and I think we're saving ratepayers' money, our centre, and I think that's it's what our residents would want. Okay. us to have a thriving centre that we can actually run. Right. Thanks. Thank you, councillors. Of course, there is an item in the report about the, about the single-year grants, mm. um, and we can talk about some of the broader issues around that um, at that time, but um, it is, it is a, a statement of fact to say that the um, amount into the grants hasn't really substantially improved or even inflation-proofed over the past six years. So that's a topic for us all to have share a conversation about. Mm. So thank you. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Hmm. The cost of the running the Enderley Community Centre, which was 100% council run the last year we ran it, provided at that time. Thank um, you. Yep, if staff can um, provide that information, I think there's a little bit of time, Andy, to maybe grab that, is there? If it can be done, we'll, we'll make sure it can. Thank Thanks. You. Thank you. And our next visitor today is Stephen Drysdale from the Citizens Advice Bureau. Welcome, Stephen. So you have this, this amount of two, three minutes of time, but uh, we'll give a little bit of time for questions as well. No worries. Um, thank you for having me, Council. Good morning. Um, as Paula has said, my name is Stephen Drysdale. Um, I'm here in my capacity as a board member for the Citizens Advice Bureau Hamilton. Um, Citizens Advice has been around since 1973. And we'd like to thank Council firstly for providing continued support through funding um, and our building for the last 26 years so that we can provide a free, autonomous and confidential service um, to Hamilton and the wider community. Now, I've put some statistics um, over our 2017 period up on the screen. You'll see that in 2017 we helped over 10,000 um, clients in our bureau. So that's our small little mm. building um, with our 60 volunteers donating around 10,000 hours of free labour, um, equating to about $240,000. Um, the cost of the client, zero. Um, unfortunately, with um, that number of clients um, and, this, and the number of volunteers we have, we do require a lot of administrative support. Um, and what that does is put a, a huge strain on our, um, our fund, our capacity to run. Um, so to give you a, a breakdown, it takes about, um, probably let's start again. Um, our operating expenses in a year are about $100,000. Um, two thirds of that are made up from salary expense. Now recently the board made a decision not to continue um, replacing a third staff member as kind of our contribution to keep costs down. But unfortunately costs are forever rising. Utilities, um, phones, we operate a comprehensive phone service through 0800 and through a d direct toll line. Um, and furthermore obviously the walk-in service as well is also provided. 
Um, so our paid administrators are vital in ensuring that our databases are correct, um, that our volunteers are giving the correct information, um, and that other community groups are supported, because um, we are a central hub um, for conveying information out to the community. Um, in terms of the change to our services, um, over time, client inquiries are becoming more complex, they're becoming more time consuming, we've got a greater um, need for our volunteers and need for support from the council. Um, while there is the availability of the internet um, and those sort of resources, um, in a situation of crisis, um, when clients are dealing with family matters, consumer matters, all those sort of matters, it's very hard for um, them to comprehend the information they're getting and they need someone who's had the expertise and given the advice to break it down for them and kind of support them in taking the active step and solving their issues. So our goal at CAB is to empower people, um, to ensure that they do not suffer through ignorance of their rights and responsibilities um, or through ignorance of any services available to them or even if they're unab unab sorry, unable to do so. And so we'd seriously, again, refer to the long-term plan, look at the increased um, the availability of grants um, because resources across the board, not just city council grants, but also other organisations, um, more non-profit organisations are trying to do good work and there's less money going round um, for all of us to continue our awesome services. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Same question to you as to Neil. You'll be submitting, um, you'll be submitting to the long-term plan around the quantum of grants and how they're distributed into the community? Uh, yes, um, the citizen's advice will be putting one in its capacity as, a, as an entity and then I'll be putting one in, in my individual capacity as well. Yeah. And just alert you to the fact that um, Lindsay Cumberpatch from one of our other philanthropic organisations has done a little bit of analysis based on information that was available through staff. You might want to touch base with him and have a wee chat about that analysis that he did. Thanks. Sure. Thank um, you. Sorry, let me just put the councillor Buntings first. Thanks very much, Chair. Tidy. Um, right, this, um, uh, are your premises big enough? Uh, as they operate right now, yes. Um, most of our, um, obviously a lot of our administrative support comes through the phone line. Um, we do have a high number of walk-in encounters, so I believe it was around, I think when you add it all up, around 3,000 or so walk-in visits. Um, in terms of, but the actual space is sufficient. Okay. Um, there's no immediate need to expand in terms of the physical building space, uh, but in terms of our citywide presence, there is, I think if you look somewhere in the report, um, it talks about one of our future goals is expanding our reach out to that northern Hamilton area, um, but that's kind of a, obviously a separate. Right, so demand's getting bigger, but you're saying the premises are big enough. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Councillor Mallard. Thanks, Stephen. Um, uh, on your handout here, you've got uh, you've broken down your inquiries by category. Uh, there's one called consumer, which is your biggest um, one. What's consumer? Uh, so consumer relates to any sort of matters involving goods and services um, or issues under the Consumer Guarantees Act. So we have a dedicated team of around, at last count, I think six or seven, um, including myself, um, specialists who will... Um, Clients will ring the bureau if they've got an uh, issue with a business, they'll talk to us and we'll oh, walk okay. them through the problem and that sort of resolution so, system. So someone's asked an electrician to come in and do some work, they, they haven't done the work well and according to the... OK, so it's helping that sort of stuff. Right. Yes. And thank you very much for all your work there. Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Gallagher. Um, as I would understand, your clouds on the horizon are your funding capacity and your current... Uh, the security of your current lease on the premises. Would that be about right? Yes. Have you, um, just on the walk-ins, how much is it walk-in? You know, I, the telephone obviously can operate from anywhere, but the walk-in is the critical factor. What numbers are we looking at? So the number of walk-ins? Yeah. Um, off the top of my head, so there's two statistics in the booklet. There's the yeah. 2,795, yeah. I'm talking about visits over 30 minutes long and around I think it's four near 500 um, over 30 minutes. Um, now that's, there's obviously more than that. We do have a lot of just brief walk-ins for pamphlets and things like that. Um, so a lot of our walk-in clients are the more complex issues. So that includes those who come to see our legal clinic, those who come to sit down with an advocate for um, uh, work and income reasons or consumer reasons, um, as well as just general complex matters, usually employment, family, and tenancy are the three major um, alternative categories. And you, as you said, you're obviously giving a sub to our LTB both on funding issues and the broader lease your current premises. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. No more questions. Thank you very much. Cool. Thank you. I look forward to your submission.
Um, our last public uh, forum speaker is Peter. Good morning, Peter. Councillors, I'd just like to acknowledge Ryan, Councillor Ryan Hamilton, and one of my board members from the Hamilton Christian Light Shelter as well. Um, I'll start off, I'm going to wear three hats today and I'm going to go over them very briefly. Um, first, um, wearing, my, wearing my night shelter manager's hat. Um, last night, the funding that you give us through the multi-year grants stopped 30 people being on the streets, stopped them being in the bushes, along with other funders, assisted us in keeping people off the streets and um, keeping them warm and sheltered. So thank you very much to, for that funding that we do get. Um, I'll move on from that because any information about the night shelter is quite easily gleaned from Brian Hamilton over coffee or lunch. So, <laughs> so um, I'll just go straight into my social worker's hat. Um, it really concerns me that some of that... Fun I know there's been um, a lot of work done in the background by Councillor Henry and Councillor Southgate uh, around trying to distribute this fund really fairly, and um, it, it's not easy. I was on the COGS committee for six years, and we had a never-decreasing amount of money, and we were trying to get it into all this and much-needed services, so I appreciate the work that's gone on in the background. But um, I, I have the same concerns as Neil about the uh, um, lack of funding going to the community houses. It's crucial that um, those points of reference actually get some money because that's where the people go first. They go there before they come to the night shelters. They go there before they become um, nuisances in the streets because they get assistance there. So it's really important that, that um, money is um, delivered into, that, into those community houses. <coughs> and that's just coming from a social worker's perspective. I put my third hat on as a father of a disabled child um, who lives in the city with high needs. Um, having a, an advisor on the um, uh, social um, uh, social development committee uh, on the social development team is really important. Um, it's a, it's a crucial thing for um, people with disabilities to have that voice and to have a lived experience voice. I really, I'm just to go sideways a wee bit. Um, the um, new toilets uh, in over in garden play in um, the gardens, you know, for uh, easy access for adults with disabilities, um, uh, for changing. Uh, that's excellent. You know, we're, we're um, sort of leading the country in that sort of stuff, and we're leading the country. From Bev Gattenby's report, I couldn't see any other disability advisors throughout the whole of New Zealand. So I think that's really important that we keep that position there. Mm -hmm. Just wearing all my hats, uh, and after reading Bev Gattenby's report. Um, I think it's crucial that the social development team stay within council. Um, we see from the costs that it's not going to be any cheaper to actually put them outside, to contract them outside. I think it's really important that they actually have um, a base where they are out together. They're not segregated into town, so they have that collegial support and they have that peer support. I think that's really important for that team because they are in um, a, a sort of occupation that is quite stressful, so having that support is really important as well. And also around the long-term security of their tenure. Um, when they're in a secure, unsecure position, we, all the social services are feeling it throughout the city. They're, they're, they're our main way of getting the, into the politics of the city, into getting the, into the policies of the city, so we know what's actually going on. And they've been our main support from council over the years. Since, since I've been doing the night shelter, I've had so much contact with them, been involved with the Variation 13 thing, with the um, psychoactive substance stuff. All the advice has come from that team, so I think it's really important. And I think just uh, Bev Gattenby's report was excellent. I think she's sort of um, hit everything on the nail. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. That was very useful feedback. And I, I'm, I'm sure that we're going to also get a submission from the Night Shelter in respect to the funding, the grants. Absolutely. And uh, thank you for the comments on the report that's coming up, which we'll discuss later yep. um, in the item. Thank you very much. I don't think there are any other questions, but we appreciate you taking the time to come in. Thank you very much. And um, just councillors note that it was councillors, councillor Henry and myself sat on the uh, multi-year grants and councillor Casson and myself oversaw the single-year grants. Okay. And um, I did put it in my report last time, but just to let you know, we acknowledge as being able to observe those processes that those both lots of grants are severely over-prescribed in terms of ask. And um, in fact, nobody got the full request that they had wanted for money, which you might find interesting, Councillor McPherson. And, um, and in fact, you know, you, 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 the ability to f even um, uh, inflation-proof, for want of a better term, some of their activities was not there in that fund at the time. But we will discuss that when we come to that matter. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you.
That was me being a bit naughty and having a sort of uh, spontaneous chair moment. But thank you for all that. Um, now we'll move on to item um, number um, five, which is the confirmation of the Community and Services Minutes from the 22nd of February. Are there any questions or comments? Moved to Councillor McPherson, seconded Councillor Taylor. Any questions? All in favour? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. That brings us on to item uh, number six, which is the General Manager's Report on page 15. Lance. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, just a bit of an update uh, in there on the Tourism Infrastructure Fund. Uh, you'll probably um, see from the minutes on page 10, um, at the last Community and Services meeting, you gave me um, some delegated um, powers to actually apply to that fund because it was imminent. Um, we've just heard, I think, Lisa, we've just heard an email this morning that the fund is now open today. Um, so <laughs> you sort of just get these things um, coming through um, uh, from DIA um, pretty quickly, and it's open until the 14th of May. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, so uh, at the last meeting, you passed a resolution to give me that delegated authority to apply for um, uh, a grant to either the, Wai the Waifokariki Nat uh, Nature Heritage Park or Hamilton Gardens Development um, projects, either or or both. Um, and, and today, um, we actually had a look at that, and, and Lisa's been having a look at uh, the criteria for the fund, which um, became a bit clear, and I think you had a bit of a briefing from um, Jason Dawson last week at the Finance G&I Finance Committee, um, just around um, what's happening around the region. So Lisa's had a look at the criteria, and we thought we, uh, uh, if you could extend that delegation for me to actually look at uh, some of the projects related to um, the river plan, and you have got an item, an update, and you had a briefing a couple of weeks ago around the river plan, um, and there's an item coming to Council on Thursday as well. So um, we just thought if we could extend that uh, delegation to um, for us to carefully look at those criteria now that everything's been announced and actually put in some applications, which we um, I will let councillors know what they are before they go in, um, but we will formally report those back retrospectively to the committee if you're comfortable with that process. Um, so happy for myself or Lisa to answer any questions um, around uh, this update uh, at the moment or the, uh, the recommendation. Thank you. Councillor McPherson. Um, I've got one on the Tourism Infrastructure Fund and one on the Rotatuna Community Hub. So is that all right if I ask them both now, or are we going to do them section by section? Oh, I, thought, I thought I'd get Andy to um, go into the interagency oh, okay, so meeting. Okay, just do the tourism one, yeah, all right? Yeah, if yeah, you're comfortable we? with that. Um, look, I have a concern. I want to ask you about the advisability of this, of diluting the application. Um, they're not going to have, like any fund every, anywhere in the country, I would imagine they're not going to have all the money that anyone needs. So uh, we've already asked you to apply for one or two of two different um, areas, and you're looking at adding a third, uh, the river project. Um, does that not run the risk of diluting the um, support that we've already indicated we'd like to get for the gardens in Waifakariki? And particularly, I have great difficulty imagining how demolition of the municipal pool is a tourism project. Um, that, that really drew my attention, that one. So some comments on that about, you know, the advisability of spreading the, the, the ask wider. Uh, yes, agree. Um, I think that's a good point. What we would just want of the flexibility, we, we, at the end of the day, we, we won't be spreading it so that we end up with a lose-lose situation. I think um, what we wanted to do is just have the flexibility to actually have a good look at all of those projects and and then staff will weigh up what is the um, what what's our best bet. Um, but we thought that um, with these being top of mind as well, which have, have been a priority that um, and obviously we, we wouldn't look at all of those eight bullet points as what would be the best bet. Obviously there's there's been a bit of um, bit of movement around what's happening with some of the river plan projects and um, and we've been having discussions with the Donny Trust as well with their million dollars. So fitting all that together. It was just to give a bit of flexibility. I can assure you that we wouldn't be watering <coughs> down what we put in for. We, we would um, be doing a bit of analysis and then weighing up what is the best bet. Is it one or two applications? 
and, and but we just wanted to widen um, the scope for that. Um, we, we were just, um, with the Hamilton Gardens development project, um, we are just mindful that we have received some significant funding before through lotteries. Admittedly, it's a different fund, but obviously government's had a hand in, in, in administering that as well. So we just wanted to broaden it, but I can assure you that we wouldn't be um, watering down and going for projects which, to be honest, wouldn't have much chance of success. But good point, appreciate that. Um, it's just a pity that we didn't have more time to actually, um, with this fund, it wasn't more certain when the time frames were and that sort of thing, so we could actually um, have, have some definitive um, answers around that. Um, look, if, if the committee's not comfortable with that, if you feel that we're broadening the scope too wide, then um, you know, obviously staff will take direction from Does committee. it come back to us, the, 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 your proposed final um, application solution? We can. Um, the problem we've got is just time frames. We would, I wouldn't come back to this committee because the next committee is six weeks away, but um, we would have to um, put it on the end. We've got a couple of extraordinary council meetings coming up. Um, we can do that. What, I, what I'd like to do is actually just work through it. I would probably send something out, an executive update or email from the GM to, um, to, to elected members. Um, and willing to receive feedback there. Um, if, you, if you feel more comfortable that we bring back the um, what other projects we would apply for, how much and how much you know, seed funding have we got and that sort of thing, meeting the criteria, happy to do that. I'll just have to work with Leanne on the timeframes around um, which, which meeting we could bring it to. But we have got a couple of extraordinary council meetings coming up over the next wee while, so we could put it on the end or of that. Or it could come to a workshop. To for if you've got an idea that you don't want to do too much work on until you get some sort of steer. But um, I, the concern I've got is that at the last meeting where this came up, I, I think we followed your staff recommendation that we look at those other two, and the other's a third one in the picture. So it's a qu question around that? Yeah, so... Well, well the reason, can... sorry, the reason being, sorry to cut you off, just the reason being is that um, the criteria became clearer from DIA and we thought that there would be um, potentially some other projects that could um, meet their criteria as well. And so we, didn't, we wanted to make sure that we have a, a range of our key priority areas and that we could actually, once we knew what the criteria was, then we can actually put in the best application um, that's best suited to those criteria, which gives us a higher chance of success. So what I propose to do here is take all the questions yeah. And then when we get into the debate, and after the debate, we can, we can at least we'll know where the council... Yeah, what that, which is why I'm asking why the change from the last staff report. Yeah, um, um, it may become clearer as councillors are able to, to say how they feel and yeah, we'll find a process to yeah. make sure that any final um, application is um, shared or worked in with councillors, because I think that's important. Yeah. Well, yeah. What, what's been yeah. happening is it looks from, from the first round that they did last year, is that correct, Lisa? It was last year, wasn't it? That um, DIA have been refining the criteria too. They had they had um, a number of um, uh, they were undersubscribed um, at one stage because of the criteria were that strict. It was difficult for councils to actually end up complying in such a short amount of time. So. So it's been a bit of a moving feast and we've been sitting there waiting just to see what the, the amended criteria are. So apologies for that, but I think your, your, your um, suggestion of us coming back with staff will work through it and then we can actually bring back some projects with the pros and cons and put those to elected members um, so that, um, with a recommendation so that you're clear on what we are applying for or what we, what we aren't applying for. But make a could, point, could point we all... here, the recommendation has some, we may want to talk about that at the right time, because the recommendation is in fact to go quite broad with your yeah. assessment. If that's not the will of council, I guess, uh, in the discussion that will come up. But I'd like to just get through the questions first yeah. and then stop yeah. and think about how we can handle that, if that's okay. Can, have could you I, yeah, I had just one last one. Which sure. were, you've just mentioned uh, the million dollars from Donny Trust. <laughs> Um, for the river project, when are we going to get a report back on on that? Because uh, last time it came up for discussion on this, com I don't know, was this committee or council, it was we asked for it to be for staff to find out if it could be applied to our current year project from memory, not the LTP projects. But now it's sounding like it's being looked at for the LTP projects, and we haven't. I don't recall having a report back on that. No, we've been waiting for them to come back to us, but Lisa can give you a bit of an update. We just had some correspondence to them just, just recently. 
Morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, so I've, we've been talking with Donny Trust and Momentum um, throughout the whole time, even uh, before Natasha, um, while Gina was uh, here. And it was, they made it, they did make it quite clear that the criteria for the million dollar pledge was to support projects that had more of a transformational um, response to the city. So when, so the annual plan projects, they felt didn't quite meet that criteria. Now with further discussions and, and I suppose pitching and, and proposing a different way to look at it and with everything else going on in the city, um, they have come back saying actually some of the things through the annual plan and proposed potential projects moving forward would better fit their criteria. So the dirty upgrade and things that are happening through the annual plan is something that they're potentially happy to put their money towards. But again, we really need to demonstrate how that's going to support a better or bigger transformational... So it could be a mixture of uh, the current year and the exactly. future LTP. Exactly. So I'm glad I wouldn't want to have seen Councillor Jeff's had one motion not being regarded as transformational. <laughs> Thanks. So, so just following up on that, um, the Chair and I were just talking before the meeting, so um, we're planning that uh, Natasha and I and, and Paula will go and meet with the Donny Trust and just get around a table and just, um, obviously we've got that suite of projects and I think we just want to make sure that um, they're comfortable and we can get some very clear direction from them what they would be comfortable with and then we can report back to the committee in, in a definitive way. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McPherson, Councillor O'Leary. Mm -hmm. um, what we used to have the external funding subcommittee. I wasn't on that subcommittee, but that set out sort of a long-term triennial approach to um, knowing what projects and things that we were working on, um, and set out that long-term strategic approach to funding. Do we? What governs our approach to external funding now? Is it just as and when projects come up? Uh, uh, similar approach, but it comes to this committee. So what staff have been doing is just been waiting to go through the LTP, um, draft LTP discussion so that we actually get um, elected member um, uh, direction on what are the priorities, because you know we have a lot of good projects that could be funded, and that was the whole reason why that subcommittee was set up in the first place, to actually then synthesise down what are the the key projects that elected members want us to focus our efforts around um, external fundraising on, unless they're just small ones below um, twenty thousand um, dollars, some you know business as usual type stuff like bat walks at the museum and that sort of thing. So, so the process is um, that we get direction from the LTP, and then that gives staff some very clear direction on what are the key uh, council projects, and then we can actually um, focus uh, Lisa and other staff's efforts um, towards those applications. Um, since you know, in, in going through that formulation time of the LTP, and obviously we're in consultation with the public now, um, obviously we have brought on a pretty much a case-by-case -case basis uh, the what staff saw as um, the current priority, such as uh, funding for playgrounds, destination playgrounds, and Hamilton Gardens, and a few other things. So, um, so generally, similar process, but coming to this full committee, and um, what we'd like to do once the LTP is pretty much locked down is um, bring a report back and say this is um, uh, definitively what we will be um, prioritising, you know, ranked from one to ten, where we should put our efforts around um, external funding. How much is the infrastructure fund? Is it a billion? Yes. Tourists. Oh. Structure fund. Uh, so there's two rounds a year, um, $25 million a year for four years. Last round they distributed $14 million, so there's approximately $11 million left in, in this round. Have we, have other TLAs been successful for more than one project? Yes, they have. Who are they, just really uh, succinctly, who are they and what projects were they? Um, so all the projects. Um, successful last year were more around car parks, freedom car um, freedom camping, uh, toilet facilities for high use kind of areas that obviously tourists, uh, tourists um, visit frequently. Um, there were 
and I can't off the top of my head and I don't have a list of um, the successful applicants last round, but there were a number, I think of the 14 total TAs, there probably was about four or five that had a number of different projects. Some were bundled, so they were different projects but related, and others were totally different. Yeah, that was going to be my second question. Not mm. not bundled ones where an application was for toilets and freedom camping and things in the same area. But so yeah. that's so that's good. Yeah. Um, just on the in scope, I'm on page twenty one because in the report it does list um, a jetty that that you think that's in scope now. Uh, is that are those bullet points that are on the top there under in scope? Are they, is that the entire criteria list or is there something else? Because there's not a lot in there that would fit um, other than supporting infrastructure for natural attractions. Is that kind of the catch-all you're hoping these the River Plan cultural precinct projects would fit in? Yeah, so um, supporting safe spaces, um, pathways, boardwalks, um, and obviously in the national attractions we feel would fit under... Um, some of the development, uh, river plan development projects. Okay. All right. And the jetty, of course, sorry, yeah. and signage, which is in the possible. Yeah, I can read yeah. those ones, but yeah, just yeah. sort of, the, the, the other bullet points seem quite um, restrictive, but it's all open to interpretation, isn't it? <laughs> Thanks, Lisa. Thank you, Councillor Mallet. Thank you. Um, the, what obligation, do, if we get awarded a grant, uh, for example, I'm looking at page 16, paragraph 7, there's a, a whole lot of bullet point things there. Some of those things may or may not go forward. Presumably, if we uh, get a grant for something and then we decide not to go forward, we just give the money back. Or is there some um, contractual obligation to do the thing once you've got the money? Um, they're aware of Council's LTP yeah. processes. They wanted to get their process underway um, uh, sooner rather than later, they don't. They're aware that um, it doesn't marry up with, you know, decision making like around the last week of June on your LTP. Um, so they would, they'll. The application is closed May the 14th. They, they'll take several weeks to actually process all those. So okay. if, at the end of the day, if we didn't fund some of these projects here, we would just advise them and say we would rather you focus on. Um, Hamilton Gardens, which is another project mm. we put in, which um, did, did get funding. So they're well aware of the council LTP process and the consultation um, obligations we have around that. So, so there has to be a bit of flexibility in this. I understand that, but does that flexibility involve returning money if it doesn't uh, marry up with what? So we can't, I assume we can't just delete one, apply for some um, money for a project, <coughs> blah, 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 public don't want that project, we no longer do it, we don't keep the money. We wouldn't get the money up, um, up front straight away in those time oh, okay. frames you're talking about, so we would just withdraw our application. Okay. And then they'd, they'd probably have a ranking system and then they'd just go to the next project further down. If they'd have got ticked off from the Westland District Council's um, LTP, then they would give the money to them. Okay, thank you. Councillor Taylor. Thank you, Paula. Yeah, Lance, um, yeah, look, look, I'm really supportive of these uh, river projects being part of the consideration here. I think that's terrific. I, I just have a question about the uh, VOTR to Embassy Park connection being part of it. Um, in terms of the time frames of that, my understanding was that particular part, if I've got it right, is up in the air at the moment. Um, and, you know, if, we've got, if we're talking about a May 14 application here, is there any kind of wisdom in having that part of the project actually in there at all? Yeah. Apologies for that. This was written before some of that, okay. those matters. I found these on the web. <laughs> Sorry. It's all right. It's just she just started talking to me. Yeah. <laughs> no, it was, it was, her name's Suri. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this was written before some of those discussions with elected members. So obviously we look at what's the reality of some of these. And, um, then, and then we would actually um, cull some of them out. So, like I said before, we'd actually look at what is the, um, what's the, what's the, the best likelihood of um, projects that would be successful to apply funding for. If we're going to defer that for various reasons, that'll be discussed on Thursday mm. um, with, with Council. Um, the reason why we left it in there, because we're still, um, still pending a decision of Council around 
um, what we do around that particular part of the project. Um, so I just wanted to have it in there just to cover off that base, even though um, the likelihood of that is probably small, but I didn't want to um, uh, put the cart before the horse on your decision making on Thursday. Is it not possible that we won't actually know about that project even on Thursday? Uh, I mean, it could be, it could, we, I don't think we will know because it, it, it's a long way away in terms of, and, and my understanding was that particular part of the project would be affected by whether or not the Central City Park went ahead as well. Uh, this is more around the the board, the, the yeah. upper promenade boardwalk. So yeah. yes, you're right. So um, and the, we won't know that till June anyway. There's that angle, and the the other thing is the as Natasha pointed out at the briefing, there's the levels of the the um, regional theatre too. About um, yes, yeah. We don't actually know what that is until they've done all the detailed design and that sort of thing. So. We just okay. want to leave it in there as a possibility because okay. just in case you guys said on Thursday, no, we want you guys to charge ahead and we'll worry about the, the levels of the theatre later on. So, um, But like I said, you know, even though it is um, probably a small likelihood, but, but we'd actually look at, those, um, uh, look at those projects there and pick out the ones which are okay. probably the most certain. Okay. Thanks, Councillor. Councillor Bunting. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, just a refresh my memory. The, I'm just looking at the page 21. Uh, in scope and possibly in scope and out of scope. Um, did we bring up the southern section of the Tiawa Cycleway in our discussions? Because it's got this written all over it. Um, it's not funded by any other uh, transport organisation. Um, it um, it's, looks like it's definitely, well, it's slated to, to be a lot more concrete, if you pardon the pun, than a lot of the projects we may be looking at. Um, and is it too late to suggest that to the group? I think we didn't put it in there just because of the complications around potential NZTA funding and those sorts of things. Uh, the NZTA funding is yeah, quite for that. It is for the bit south of the city, outside the city, but not the bit inside the city. I was thinking by the river down... You know, Are you talking about within our... Yeah, within our... Within our boundaries yes. going through... Um, the sorry, Gally. Hammond yeah, Park. Hammond Park. Yeah, yeah. I lost it. Um, I still think there's um, you know some work to be done there around the um, uh, the resource consent and the route through Hemmond Park. So we we wanted to just make sure that we were going to put projects in there. But if 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 you want us to consider that, um, we can. We'd probably if we we're going to report back, we'd probably have to do a little bit of work on that, and I'd have to um, we just have to work with Chris's team on that too. Yeah, so I think we'll, we've got it reasonably early in the suggested ten-year plan, and so there's a there's a fair bit of work available for you straight yeah. away. Um, but it, it's up to the group. But I'd be certainly like to raise a flag on it. Well, if if if, if the committee's of a mind f to add that to it, um, we can do that. Um, but mm. just bearing in mind that we end up with um, you know an even bigger range of projects to look at. So. Um, but th that's your prerogative. What what are your priorities? As, yeah, as I'm, I'm just members. looking at it as a, as a against criteria uh, point of view. It strikes me as a as a lay down museum that one, but um, be worth having a, a talk about, Chair, at some stage. Okay. Um, well, we've noted that, and I guess we can um, bring it up in discussion. Um, I guess my question around that, and I see Jeff's also got a question, um, in terms of working with other parties on that project. Have we even had a conversation? with them because that would be a first action wouldn't it to talk mm. with yeah absolutely we definitely need to um, have a collaborative approach I think in that space and big so time we, yeah. big time it, it, it so strikes me four it's weeks, gonna be um, we do have a four week working with um, other parties on this um, yeah. uh, both NZTA and the WIPA District Council and also yeah. oh, the no, Waikato Regional that. Council. I'm, ta I'm talking in a project delivery in the city level. That was all, but um, yeah. because it seems to me that if there are other parties, NZTA, the River Trail Trust, and so on, that conversation should be occurring. That's all. Mm -hmm. The yeah. only um, other consideration would be, although they might not be funded, one of the criteria is that it's not eligible for any other central government funding. So that's just another thing that we'd have to work through whether that the the project, mm. even though not funded, is it in fact eligible for other funding? So there, that no. might be a question yeah. there. So that yeah, um, so there'd, there'd be all the detail we'd have to look through. Jeff, you had a quick question on that. I see. 
Uh, oh, no, I'm was, coming a bit to you, Mike. It, oh, it was just one. It was more, um, it was more following up the, the implications of that on the Tiawa project, I suppose. Um, uh, just along the lines you're talking about. Um, so I've, I've just, I'm a little unwilling to have that thrown into the mix at this stage myself. I was just, yeah, I thought you had a question on what Mark was. Mark, yeah. carry on. <clears throat> no, no, yeah, I'm just saying, um, workload wise though, I think as Dave was alluding to, a lot of the work has been done by a lot of different uh, agencies and discussions have already been had, so it, it might be a reasonably easy one to have a crack at. So question, yeah. questions at this point, but we will. Sorry, yeah. Well, yeah. Okay, so that's been noted. And um, if there's nothing else that I want to say on that particular matter to draw to our attention. No? Thank you, councillors. Are there any other questions on matters outside of the, uh, the in the report that outside of the tourism fund? Or did you want to talk to those, Lance? Uh, we've got Andy's here who's um, put this part of the report together on my behalf. So, and I think, um, oh yeah, that's right. Um, Councillor McPherson had a question, I think, on the community hub. Sure. Sorry. You question. Oh, I, I was did you waiting want to for hear? the chair. I was just, um, well, I was just waiting to hear who was going to present this part of the report. Shall we let Andy have, a, have his the few points, raise the most pertinent points from the report and then take questions? And you're first on the list, Councillor McPherson. Thank you, Councillors. Just uh, really, I guess, brief paragraphs to bring attention to councillors of some of the work that the team is involved in and some of the conversations that are occurring across our community. Uh, there's lots of depth beyond uh, all of the paragraphs and so happy to, to answer any questions both here formally but also um, offline if you want to pick up any particular bits that you want to drill down into. Um, I can support that outside of the, the meeting as well. But Councillor McPherson. Councillor McPherson. Yes. Um Three questions actually on 12, 13 and 14. On 12, has, I think it's great the work's going on out in the northeast with the community hub. Have they been looking at or considering or asking us for support on uh, getting a sort of a hub physical locality, premises sort of going? I, I know they operate sometimes out of one of the churches there, but uh, I'm not sure how permanent or uh, sole use that is? It's definitely a, a constant conversation that they as a trust are having, uh, Fungi and the DIA our partners are working through some of what that looks like. Part of the, the flying sofa sessions, which are essentially a, a flying couch. Flying sofa? Yep, a couch on a trailer <laughs> that uh, moves around the community and stops somewhere and uh, basically trust members are sitting on the couch inviting others to sit with them and ask questions and share their ideas. Uh, part of that planning and part of that constant conversation is about space and location. They haven't directly come to council asking for uh, funding towards a facility, but it's definitely part of the conversation as to next steps and what might um, happen. Are they working in with our people that are working on the community centre as part of the Rotatuna Town Centre? Uh, they are definitely a, a part of that conversation space and what that whole northeast looks like. They are a, a really active community group, uh, both from gathering people to our spaces. So there will be a number of their representatives on Wednesday out at the Rotatuna, and we're definitely talking with them as a trust around what things look like. Yes. So that process we talked about last week um, around the building of the library and community hub. I think that can be inputted into that. That's the intention. And then obviously that'll come to councillors in a number of briefing sessions and we'll look at, you know, Andy's team will gather up what, are, what are all the needs we're hearing off from people and that sort of thing. And obviously then we'll have to distill that down, but we'll bring that to council to have a look at and give some direction on too. The second question, thanks for that, that's good. The second question I had related to the community safety concerns and the the failure of the police to restore the community police police um, around the town. Um, I'm glad this got a mention in here, but I'm wondering what have, has council taken official stance of supporting the restoration of the community police to support community safety improvements. Yeah. Council staff are working with our police partners all the time in terms of the concerns of both residents and organisations. We 
as has been articulated in this forum many times, we can't tell another organisation what they should do, but we definitely support our partners in you know, the community noise that our local police are really valued and having those uh, regular faces in the same places adds value to the community safety. But we have all these agreed here, I guess it's a little bit of a tricky thing when it's not our business uh, fully. Um, sorry, with all due respect through you, Madam Chair, this council often expresses opinions on matters concerning so, our community so that are actually implemented by another agency. Council McPherson is still in questions, but you're, yes, I'm, you're I'm welcome asked. to raise it in debate. Is a question? Yeah, well, I I'm, asking, it's a topic. I'm asking where the idea has come from that we can't express an opinion on whether there should or shouldn't be community police. I'll let the, I'll let the general manager answer that question. Um, <laughs> I, I actually, you bring up a good point about this has come up a number of times in this committee and predecessors mm. of this committee. I think it's probably a topic that uh, we should have a discussion at, at a briefing. And um, just like any other submission we have, um, whether it's on another council's LTP or a piece of government policy, I think that would be a good place for that discussion to happen so that um, A, councils are very clear on what the situation is and probably getting an update from the police um, through some information that Andy and Kelvin could gather on what is the situation. You know, we're hearing that they're recruiting more staff and, and what's their new way, uh, modus operandi. And then uh, councillors can have a discussion on that and then potentially, it, you know, um, where do we go to actually put forward those ideas or those opinions if that's the will of the council? Could we then leave it up to you as general manager yeah. to get that on the agenda? Yeah, I can, I'll put it on the briefing list, so work with Leanne on that. Thanks. And Thanks. the last question related to Oranga Tamariki rather than Onaga Tamariki, um, the spelling there. Um, they, this is a government agency setting up, it looks like, two new community hubs in areas where we already support um, community hubs um, run, started up by the community, but obviously listening to Neil earlier, Neil Tolan, that include already have government agencies working from their places uh, at times. Is it not, well, I don't like your opinion on this, is it not um, doubling up scarce or the or demand on scarce community resources by having a government agency coming into a so called uh, low socioeconomic area and setting up its own hub when we already have hubs there? Uh, the, so, Oranga Tamariki. Apologies for the spelling there. Uh, they were talking with our West Hamilton interagency group particularly and said they're really interested in having some of their staff located, uh, particularly in, in the Norton existence, uh, five days a week and be able to do many things. So they were looking for a community partner to establish the hub within. Uh, and Tsurunga Pai, uh, the Good News Centre, um, have just kind of announced that, that the staff have moved into some of their office space and so the, uh, the team from the Ministry for Children will be based out of uh, Tarungapai five days a week. Doing that's on Livingston Ave? Uh, that's on Dominion Brecon's, corner of Dominion and Brecon's okay. Road. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. yeah. So it's not a new building, it's partnering with a yeah. community organisation. Our similar model will be in Fairfield though I haven't, if I can't share currently where that will be. Oh, that's good. I just have a concern, Madam Chair, that mm. government agencies are coming and setting up community hubs. I don't know that they're the right people to do that, but I'm glad they're working in with someone already going in the community. Thank you. That's your questions? Yep. Thank you. Councillor Tooman. Um, yeah, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, how far are we down the track as far as the community house in the St Andrews area is concerned? We have, uh, as our staff, have been working with both the DIA in terms of potential funding opportunities and uh, community-led development uh, opportunities, as well as residents who are, are really keen. So they've been meeting for a long time, uh, talking through the aspirations from a small group. Currently, we've got a bit of work going on with around surveying residents to see if the the ideas of the small are the ideas of the many as well. So we are currently in that gathering, the, the needs assessment stage really. So we've definitely heard the voices of a few and we're in the process of uh, making, verifying that with a wider um, target. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, I'd be quite keen to become involved in that mm -hmm. if, uh, you know, if you're looking for another body or something like that. Excellent. We, uh, uh, we, I know they had a meeting yesterday afternoon, so I'll, I'll update you in terms of sure. how things are going. Um, the other one there is this community safety, particularly in Dinsdale. We seem to be getting quite a bit of stick from the Dinsdale community. And I think one of the issues over there is I've noticed Dinsdale sort of go downhill over the last 20 odd years. And it's mainly on the, what I would call, uh, Whara Whara Road area. Um, we've got that. There is a uh, question coming, isn't there? Yep. Um, and I think d when I look at that area, I think one of the issues is that um, it looks pretty sad and tired, to tell you the truth. Is there anything we can do, just from the council perspective, things like the removing of road signs, road cones, a bit of water blasting and all that sort of stuff, which would really tidy that area up. And I think if we can get that place to look and feel, although it's um, a little bit more upmarket than what it uh, appears to be, is there anything which we can do as a council um, to, uh, like the rubbish bins, for example, you know, there's chewing gum everywhere and uh, bins are dirty and all those sort of things. So is there something we can do just as a council, cheap, but just to tidy the place up a bit? I know the majority of the shops that you're referencing are um, private property. Yeah. Uh, I would have to talk with our infrastructure crew in terms of what that looks like and I can report back to you in terms of, I guess, what is already occurring but also what potentially um, is the scope. And if uh, a bit of road work go on, they leave the signs behind and they leave the road cones out and all that sort of stuff. It's just really basic maintenance which we've got to look at. I can follow that up for you, Cut. Councillor. Thank you, Councillor Tooman. Councillor Henry? And um, that's the impact, especially um, towards the affordable housing. Now, um, I assume there's quite a number of people attending these meetings, and um, they've got all very intelligent heads. So I just wonder, uh, has there any been any ideas coming out of these meetings? I mean, it's great to to um, tell us this is what comes yeah. out of them, but I. I I also feel that people have ideas as well of how some of these challenges can be solved. So has anything come out of these meetings? There's definitely a, a variety of interested parties that kind of talk at our interagency and network meetings. And some like uh, Sam from Sharma mm -hmm. is really active in gathering people around potentially new ideas to the city, including, you know, land bank ideas and you know the trusts that could take place uh, i'm aware of the conversations from some of our partners around um, the special housing stuff that has been presented to the council mm -hmm. and also there's a, a bit of research occurring at the moment particularly in the youth space not only what is um, what is occurring but what could take place so there is there's a variety on that spectrum and to succinctly say in a point, uh, I would take a longer conversation to be honest, uh, but there is definitely not just a we're in trouble, but what can we do about that as a city. So I know we'll hear from some of those parties in terms of our 10 year plan process and we're in other conversations with partners around the, the space. The, the youth uh, and particularly our young people and their needs, that would be a really interesting piece of research that's happening from the youth sector uh, that will hopefully have some really clear um, recommendations for not only us as council but the wider community to take up as well. Okay, thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Councillor um, Deputy Mayor Gallagher. With regard to the St Andrews Community House, what um, liaison would you have had with, say, the Pukiti uh, Hub? Because obviously, clearly, um, you know, they are occupying that space, obviously. Uh, the other areas I can think of our church community down Barden Road. So I'm just trying to work out, you know, with other key players and, and to what degree you would involve them in the, in the conversation. Um, um, I'm intrigued as to a potential location. Is it in the St Andrews Golf Club or building or where, where are you going to put the community house? We're not quite at the uh, physical location space yet, Councillor, uh, but we've definitely had Pukiti and the local church communities involved in those conversations, uh, both from... Uh, from a Pukiti point of view, is a, there's an opportunity for a satellite versus yeah. uh, actually is it better to be self-determined by another group? And so they've been a part of the 
the conversation since the inception a couple of years ago from a community member coming forward saying we need. There's a bit of challenge from some of the group around whether a faith-based building is uh, a possible location. Yeah. Uh, so that's all part of that ongoing conversation around what are the actual needs uh, in terms of why do we have a building? Is there particular services that are needed or is it uh, the provision of space that is needed? So that will hopefully all be revealed in the needs assessment that currently is Because obviously underway. what I look with, if we look at any idea, I mean, obviously any community and people can clearly do what they want, but if it, any aspect of rate, you know, council facilitation and funding uh, then clearly um, I'd just be anxious that it didn't detract from the model in that area and, and I could I could understand a satellite in terms of synergy of governance and um, funding. Uh, yeah, so you'll be coming back to us on that? Th those details will all reveal themselves because, you know, we've obviously got a fantastic library in the space as well and, you know, there are many potential, right. but we're not at that point where we're, we're committed to our particular space yet we really still are kind of testing the waters and figuring out what the community wants and needs and so we will continue that conversation with you. Thank you. Um, just on your paragraph 10 um, I was interested maybe it was a grammatical error on the second bullet point you're not saying that large gathering of bike gatherings of bikers are stealing you're saying that people are stealing from groups of cyclists? Uh, there's been definitely an increase in individual bike thefts, which have then increased the number of bicycle-typed gang activity. So those people are coming on a big bunch of bikes, like it says here and yes, there? Yes, yeah. Okay. Uh, there's a few. Um, wow. Yeah. So it's getting a lot more organised in itself, obviously, if you get groups together there. And, and some of it is um, simple transport safety in terms of uh, you know wheelies on roads and you know there, there's a there's a little bit of intimidation that sits there yeah. <laughs> I, I was the, thank you I just thought that it could be interesting that sentence could be read two ways with the with the grammar there but but you are actually saying that this is becoming more organized and that people are being intimidated by groups of people on a bicycle James is nodding yeah well that's disappointing Okay, thank you. And, and it just brings one question, last question for me, that community safety concerns. Um, I know councillors working with individual businesses, concerned individuals, police and others to help address these concerns. Now, we've all attended a number of meetings in recent times around that. Um, my question around that is how are we working? There was a really good um, project around City Safe, led by Councillor O'Leary. And at the, towards the end of that, I think it's fair to say that the uh, wider issues around crime in other suburban, suburban shopping areas and other ways became a key interest. So how are we progressing this going forward? So our city safety team are, are incredibly uh, responsive to people who call up and uh, request assistance. So they not only deal with potential antisocial behaviour that's going on, but they give our businesses advice around how they could better ensure that their business is not a target. Uh, so they talk through some of that kind of advice. I know that our community advisors have been, as a result of some of the public meetings that have taken place, there's been small gatherings of residents that our staff have supported to uh, continue them being able to have a forum to talk and to think through different ideas. Uh, the police have been doing some recent drop-in things that we've been able to support both residents getting to those um, forums and then us also being able to have those conversations with the police in terms of what is occurring. Uh, there's still growth in neighbourhood support groups within a, a local street level of concerned people saying let's gather together to have a corporate response rather than just being victimised. So there's a few kind of levels there from an advisor uh, to businesses, advisor to residents, and then just working with our partners in terms mm. of... And, and from a governance level, because we have that really good strategy around the central city safety, and the, would we be looking to take some of those broad principles and apply them in other suburban shopping areas? We did talk about 
we touched on it, but we, you know, and it was it was a great conversation. A absolutely, the Central City Safety Plan talks really around. We work in partnership with people. We provide uh, safe spaces, and we use our policies and our strategies, our bylaws, to great effect. So essentially, those things can be rolled out everywhere because we want to work in partnership with the community. We absolutely want to build good urban design and safe spaces where we're doing those kind of renovations mm. and then equally where, where it's appropriate that we have legislation behind us, we, we roll that out. Mm. We, as a central city safety plan, next step we are going to gather with elected members early May just to kind of gather what is already in the plan for 2018-19 but also what else uh, potentially could be so that would be the at. place to have that conversation yeah. about our wider responsibilities and absolutely thank you okay. all right councillors there's a recommendation um and we have been told just that we will get um some further understanding what that looks like we're not quite landed on in terms of um the applications that you do make to the tourism fund, because I think it's been a clear steer from council that they want to know what was in it. One of the clear points made in questioning was around that dilution factor and adding any other new projects in. But this is the recommendation at the moment. Change. Okay. okay. Uh, but it might be, it, it just changes, approves that to request that staff consider. So it's, it's a change to B. Mm -hmm. The first word approves, it says request that staff consider, and they're highlighted, and then it, <coughs> excuse me, and reports back to council at an appropriate time, so it's pretty much what you were saying, but uh, if we say just approves, that sort of accords it a priority which we haven't yet decided. Okay. Um, Lance would like to make a clarification. Uh, just a little clarification, I was just talking to Lisa, um, with uh, Councillor Taylor's um, question around um, applying for projects that have some uncertainty to them at the moment that we would you know we'll probably want to do that um, apparently they're quite flexible on the time frame that you complete these projects in so you could say that you would do the um, the upper boardwalk project uh, in three years time or two years time so they've got some flexibility around that so that's the reason why the staff um, kept some of these projects in there so I just wanted to clarify that and I, I actually diddled up a C for um, uh, for what um, Councillor Dave was talking about was staff report back recommendations to Council by the 10th of May 2018 on wh which projects it will make applications to the TIF fund for. And which projects it proposes making an application for? Oh, I think keep, keep your B oh, and, then, and then staff report back recommend, recommendations to Council on which projects. So we'll come back with some prioritisation work that I descri described before and with some recommendations, and then um, at the end of the day, you guys can make the decision on those. Okay, so you're happy to put the, uh, do you want to put that C in? We don't really need the so yellow just, bit at the bottom. Yeah, we're just gonna put the C in, and while that's being done, Councillor Bunting, you were interested in testing the, the willingness of Council to include Tiawa River Trails th through the town section. Yeah, and uh, uh, we'll speak to that in debate. If that's okay. Well, so it's not in any worded? recommendation at the moment. I'm just, no. sort of, I'm just saying, suggesting to you that you have a think about how you want to progress that, if if that's important. Mm -hmm. You might, you might find a willingness, given that it's only requests now for it to be included on the list. It may be discounted quite readily if it doesn't stack up or whatever. But that's in the hand. That would be in the hands of the mover and seconder. Is that? I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. Angela, do you have something to say about it? I, I think if I could speak sort of a little bit out of turn, I think the Tiawa one, we just we do need some more information. Yeah. And perhaps offline that could be done with staff and then staff could take it on themselves to talk at the workshop we're gonna have yeah, that's what you want more to about it. We need a, yeah. Yeah, so so we'll do some we'll without do, mentioning it specifically because we yeah. Yeah. we'll do some research and then let you know whether it's possible or not. Yeah. And then if it is then um, we could uh, when, when this report comes back, we can include that information um, at the 26th of April or the 10th of May meeting, depending which deadline we hit, yeah. and then you guys can make a decision from there. Yeah, because I mean, how often are these rounds? Yeah, you 
use the twice a twice year. Twice a year, yeah. yeah. What are they, Lisa? Yeah, twice a year, so So we could always bring that back for the next round, and and we've got there's another round next year as well. So. Our LTP part of Tower is not yeah. it doesn't need to hit until year two. Mm. Okay, so I think we're clear on the process that it's not lost. Do you have your Just wanted to make sure, yeah. Councillor Bunting, that you had your opportunity to help appropriately Great. deal with it. So now we have um, this recommendation. No uh, moved and seconded. No one's put the staff recommendation. I think we're all we've all moved on from there in any case. So. Um, we'll have debate and we'll start with the mover. Oh, look, I think don't think much needs to be said other than we've had a new idea put to us and a possible fourth idea. Let's get some information there so we can stack up the priorities because if we apply for all three, we're not going to get all three. So let's, uh, let's make sure that we get enough information to tell the tourism outfit uh, what we like best and think we should need the most help with. So that's all this is doing. Thank you. Councillor O'Leary. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, Councillor McPherson's covered that off nicely. I wanted to actually make a comment um, in my debate on the, um, what is it called, O-Ranga? O O-Ranga. Um, and the opportunities to have um, this council to have some very persuasive, and I'm supporting Councillor McPherson's comments earlier in the, or questions, um, for this council to not lose the opportunity to have some very high level persuasive discussions with those um, or any government organisation. Um, I believe um, Rotorua Library and Community Hub have got a uh, government agency in there. I think it is at Whānau Ora. Um, and not only <coughs> is the location of that government agency in that community hub uh, giving greater ex access to our vulnerable community and vulnerable people, but of course it provides revenue for that facility. So we do have some exceptional um, community facilities around, not only owned by council or operated by council, but of course we've heard from um, <coughs> Neil Tolan today and the Western Community Centre is um, certainly, for me, is is the uh, epitome of of how a community hub should run. So I just, I'm, I guess, I'm directing this to our mayor and um, and perhaps CEO or general manager, whoever is appropriate, to go and have those very persuasive um, discussions because this is an opportunity I don't think we want to see passed up. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor O'Leary. Councillor Casson. Um, yes, I, um, I support the motion. But um, just to clear up um, with the uh, recent bike thefts and antisocial behaviour, they're, um, named the, they're known as the Wheelie Boys and they do um, steal bikes and get into large groups and cause mayhem um, running over people and everything else and um, running around the road and causing havoc with uh, motorists. Um, in regard to the Rotatuna um, safety meeting we had, um, there are further, further meetings planned with um, uh, uh, members of the public and police invited. I'm working with Jamie Strange at the moment to um, uh, have another one in Hamilton East and one in Hamilton West, and there may be even a, um, a CBD meeting with businesses as well on safety meetings. So uh, it's not a it's not a dead duck. It has to be something that keeps on going, uh, it's because um, those those meetings are a really important uh, forum for the community uh, voice to be heard loud and clear by police. They do want community police back in the um, in the suburbs. Um, and from the Rototurner safety meeting we had, there's been a, um, a, a really good increase in the uh, amount of neighbourhood support group inquiries and people setting up, so that's a plus there. And there was also an increase in the uh, committee patrollers signing up for uh, the North Hamilton committee patrollers. So uh, look, um, also um, just on a side note there, Stuart Nash, has um, he gave uh, an assurance that uh, community councils will be up and in place by the end of uh, Labor's first term. If they're not, that may be their last term. So, um, yeah, so uh, he, he has given that assurance. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, thank you also, Councillor Casson, for organising that meeting with, um, uh, with um, Jamie Strange at that time. Councillor Gallagher. Yeah, I think, I think Stuart Nash is in town later in the week. Uh, also compliment James Casson because I think um, this is a project that we want to be work with the current government on. Um, and uh, very important that we get through. And so there's a clear political <coughs> leadership direction and it doesn't, however, get um, diluted at, at a senior management level. You know, I think the government's there elected to govern, 
and I'd expect senior management to implement uh, new government policy. Um, I'm glad that uh, Angela raised the issue with regard to Ministry for Children and Community Hub, uh, and I would welcome our community development teams forwarding information about the Rotorua Hub concept, which was a brain's child of Mayor Stevie Chabak and, and other agencies, and seeing if that has any relevance. Um, obviously, also note, if you look at library services and some of those things, the, if you look at the concentric rings, uh, then Norton and Fairfield obviously um, would, would, would uh, benefit. So I think there's a, a broader approach that can be taken here, and maybe the Rotorua uh, hub concept, which includes library services, community services, et cetera, may be something worth looking at. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bunting. Thank you. Uh, I just very gently um, thank the staff for the work they're going to do on the, uh, the tower. Uh, potential down the track. It is, it is uh, cycling is going to be a major tourism attraction to the city. Uh, once that is built, a lot of the work is already done. It meets a lot of the, the criteria here. It's uh, not categorised as Jason said the other day as one of the great rides of um, of New Zealand. Um, it's not necessarily funded by NZTA. We're looking at co-funding, and I think we've got a lot of potential great partners. So I think this work could be an easy one for, if not this round, the next one. So I'm excited about uh, the possibilities. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just make a few comments myself. No other further questions at this time. Um, I, in light of the projects that are proposed in this recommendation, I will vote for the recommendation. Having said that, I share the view that the municipal pools is not an demolition is not an appropriate project. Um, and just going to to lodge my disagreement with that one being in there. I don't think it should be in there at this time because it's not connected with, it's not connected to activities of the river plan that we're doing at this time in the proposed in the long term plan so it's the timing thing is all wrong there if we were going to put something on to remove it and then do something in that space um, that really turned up the dial maybe so uh, I'm just going to also speak strongly for the uh, one that we did approve last time which is the zoo and lake Waifakariki and I still remain quite um, interested in connecting the entrance way to Lake Waifakareki in a meaningful way to an upgrade of the entrance to the zoo, so we get a win-win in that respect, and it makes it a really exciting visitor destination. Uh, let's remember that Waikato Tourism have told us on a numerous occasions that the gardens are fabulous and we need a second draw card for the city. Um, Sooner or later, the Riverside experiences will be a second draw card for the city, but uh, the zoo remains a destination that's well loved and well visited. And uh, with the opening of Lake Waifakariki, doubly exciting, I believe. Um, um, and I'm sure when councillors go for their site visits to the zoo, you'll be able to have a look at, at that and think about that yourselves. Um, the other comment I want to make is around the increasing funding for grants. In my previous chair's report, I expressed my concern and the discomfort of all those individual people who helped determine where those grants should go around the fact that this fund has not improved in quantum for some time. We're unable to, um, uh, to give people inflation adjustments for their activities and we're declining more activities more and more and most people are getting a, only a portion of what they actually asked for. So I think that tells us something that we need to be aware of, and I would like um, some consideration by staff on that prior to the LTP so that when submissions are going to come in to that effect, we've got some rational basis for conversation as well. So um, excited that um, potentially the Tiawa River Trails could be included because I do think um, if you could get right the way from Naru or Wahia through to the velodrome, we've really created something spectacular there in the way of a bike route. So, thank you. Uh, so, got more questions now. Councillor Mallet. Thank you. Um, I'll be supporting this, but that is not to say I uh, support all or any of the projects that will be funded. But if a majority of this council does determine to go ahead with all or any of those projects, I would rather that some of the funding came from other than our ratepayers. So uh, that's the rationale for my support. Thank you, Councillor Mallet. Councillor Taylor. 
Paula, um, I wasn't going to speak to this, but I feel now that I need to put a plug in, seeing as everybody else is putting a plug in. Uh, I totally support the uh, potential to put some of these river projects in um, into the fund. Let's let's have a look at that. Definitely, uh, I believe, um, with all due respect to Lake Waifakariki, uh, in terms of what's happening in Hamilton, uh, apart from Hamilton Gardens, maybe the the river project uh, has the most potential to uh, to be transformational in bringing visitors to the city. So, to me, there's a clear priority there. Uh, so, yep, just, that's just a plug for how I feel very strongly that the river plan needs to be part of this. Thank you, Councillor Taylor. Any further debate? No? Then we will go to voting on... Our... Oh, sorry, I don't see you up there. Oh, sorry, right of reply. Thank you, Councillor McPherson. I thought you might press your button and give me a hand. <laughs> to remind you, no. Mm. With my stiff neck. <laughs> two, just two things that have come up um, during discussion based, arising out of the Chair's report. Firstly, the necessary uh, uh, improvement in community grant levels um, that she talked about, I strongly ag agree with and will be, even though of course I will have an open mind, I'll be moving during the uh, LTP discussions that we have a reasonable increase and that it's inflation proof for the future. Um, so that's just uh, for the LTP discussions. And uh, perhaps with the demolition of the pool, I had a second thought on that, helped by my colleague Councillor Casson here, that you could have quite a good tourism project where uh, you get to press the button and the big ball swings down and <laughs> smashes the, the... It could be quite an innovative tourism project, the demolition of the pool. So maybe I'm thinking again on that one. Put the weedy boys in there as well. Yeah, put, the, put them in there as well, yeah. All right. So on that highly Trans serious note, we'll go to the vote. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's for this one. Okay, councillors, I'm going to take a um, eight... M Sorry, okay. Reset. Oh. Are we doing it again? All done? All good? The motion is carried unanimously. Thank you. Councillors, I'm going to take an eight minute break so that you just can get up and stretch, go and get a drink or use the, com you know, take a comfort stop. Um, would, no, no, we'll make it 15 minutes and have morning tea. Um, sorry for, is that okay, Bev? Be happy you come and join us for coffee anyway that would be great thank you
Thank you. Welcome back, councillors. Welcome to our guest, Bev, this morning. It's good to have you here. And um, we've all read your excellent report. I'm sure there are going to be um, a number of questions because it's really important stuff that's contained in this document. So I will um, just leave it. Is Debbie going to introduce it and then Bev's going to talk to the report? Yes? Thank you. So, yeah, uh, good morning, Mayor and Councillors. Thanks for having us here today. I'd just like to introduce Dr Bev Gappenby, who uh, is the consultant who worked with us on this report. Um, in front of you, I'm going to hand over to Bev shortly, but in front of you you've got a couple of handouts. One of them I've prepared for you just to give you a little bit more clarity around the financials. So um, in the agenda on page 73, you'll see the table of finances there. Just to note that that does include grants and it also includes our indirect costs. So in the handout I've given you, I've just um, given you the breakdown of those financials in a little bit more detail so you can just see what the direct activity cost is. And I'm just going to hand over to Bev now. She's also given you a handout to, uh, to talk to as well. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair, Mayor Andrew and Councillors. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you too. Did you say there's a handout for Bev? It's a one page like that. Oh, okay. 
ju just a handout with key points to help see the structure of what I'm going to talk about. So I'm only going to very briefly summarise the report. Um, you've had the full report and obviously I'm very happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, so just to start with a couple of um, very, very broad and simplified concepts around community development, um, which is a way of working with communities. Now, there's always a risk when we talk about that because it can seem so process-oriented that there aren't outcomes. What I want to say to you really clearly that community development clearly is a process, but it is also meant to be um, outcomes-oriented. Um, and so you'll see there that it's about engaging with communities, creating shared visions, building trust, um, coming together. The, the most current way of talking about community development is, is the term community-led development. And what that has done is to broaden it from a kind of a social service concept with um, marginalised communities, but to say that community development actually works right across all sectors, um, so social, economic, cultural, um, philanthropic, environmental, um, all of those sectors benefit from taking a community development approach and that the best community development projects look at shared visions across all of those sectors. Whoops. Uh, in terms of Hamilton City Council, you have um, an effective and able team of community development workers. They are well networked, they're skilled, uh, they have a wide range of relationships and by and large they are well regarded. However, I do think uh, that the, their work could be more strategic and that there are a number of ways that that could happen. Um, first of all, to look inside council. Um, first of all, there's a need, I guess, to see community development as highly strategic and to value those workers as some of your key leaders in understanding and working with communities. Um, from a governance point of view, the team needs clear strategy and clear focus. And what I heard probably both from the councillors I spoke with and from the team and from people outside of the team, uh, outside of council rather, is that it's not clear just what it is that they are aiming towards. Now I was quite interested in the city safety conversation that went on earlier when I was listening, because clearly there's both a governance level focus and a team focus. And so it was very clear that everyone was working towards something. I just suspect there's been a little bit of drifting, um, perhaps both at a governance level and at a team level, and so it's less clear what the focus is for their work. Uh, once you do have really clear governance priorities um, and focuses, um, then the governance group and the executive management team need to be really supportive of community development for it to work well. Uh, I also think that it's important that a community development team has wide links right across council. So rather than being seen as the group, are they the ones who go out and talk with the community about social issues, community development staff need to be connected right across council and working wherever they are needed around council priorities. And in particular inside this council with the way that you are structured, I think a link with the strategy and growth department would be one of the most strategic things that you could do to support the work, both of council and of the, the community development team. Um, so I've said there needs to be more focus, and I think there are two ways of focusing. One is to look at significant issues and figure out which ones are the most significant place where the community development team has a role. City safety is one that's come through this morning. There are other possibilities. Housing has also come through this morning. There is a need, in my view, across our city for a facilitating, collaborate, encouraging collaboration kind of role to bring together um, what's going on in the many conversations about both affordable and social housing. Um, and that council might choose that that's a focus. There are a wide range of reports and um, strategies around already, which I believe with a good overview um, done by staff um, and some solid thinking by you as a governance group would, would lead to some quite clear focuses. So I'm thinking, for example, of the Vital Signs Report, um, the Regional Strategy Moving Waikato 2025. You know, there are a number of places that you could draw on to identify, identify some clear focuses for community development. And secondly, community development tends to be place-based, which is one of the reasons why it's so important for local government, because local government is almost the ultimate place-based organisation. Um, 
significant locations as a way of focusing the work as well. So, and there's a tension between saying we work citywide and we work in quite specific neighbourhoods. My view is that there does need to be a sense of covering the whole city, but there are projects over time. Uh, this morning we've heard uh, about Rotatuna, Dinsdale as a possibility, so identifying a particular neighbourhood or a community by some kind of identifying feature um, and saying we're going to focus there for three years or five years and having some specific outcomes that are being looked for um, in terms of that. Um, in terms of um, becoming more strategic with communities, uh, quite a specific possibility was raised from people outside of council, and that's a focus on civic engagement. There is an, a, a very strong amount of interest um, in civic engagement, and that's an obvious space for a community development team to work. Um, I've talked about community-led development. There's an opportunity there because um, Sport New Zealand and Sport Waikato um, but also the community services team and the Department of Internal Affairs are all taking a quite specifically community-led de development approach. I suspect that will be a strong policy thread through the current government. And what that means is there's an opportunity here. Now, it came from others to say, actually, we'd really appreciate leadership from Council in bringing us together and making sure that we're working in a way that enhances each other's work. So there's an opportunity there for Council, I believe. Um, but also, part of what um, happens when a community development team gets really strategic is that they make council strategy more relatable um, for people in communities. Um, I imagine you are all, well, I know you are all significant in providing a face for council um, in your constituencies. Uh, community development workers also have a really strong role in being a face for council as well. Um, so I was asked also to look at different ways of delivering community development. Uh, and so I looked at a range from keeping it in-house as it is now, employed and, and managed in-house, um, through to, so I looked at um, still employing the staff um, by council, but locating them out in different um, community settings, um, or a mix of those things, or completely uh, moving them out into, contracting them out to either a range of community organisations or to one community organisation. Um, so there was some cost analysis done of that. Um, and I talked at length with the other key agencies who, um, who contribute to community development from a city-wide perspective. Uh, my recommendation is that it stay as it is. To be honest, that wasn't what I expected to recommend when I came into the project. Um, there are a number of reasons that I'm recommending it. First of all, cost effectiveness. There is no cost savings to be made unless you significantly reduce the quality of the service. Um, and that would be an extraordinarily difficult thing to do, um, in my view. Um, feedback from the community sector. There were two um, people that I interviewed who said they would like to see the community development workers based specifically in community houses. Um, but other than those two, the, the rest, all of the rest were very clear that they want community development to remain inside council and for the community development team to bring with it the mana and influence of council. So they see council as having a key role in how we think about visions for our communities and they want community development workers to be part of that process. So they would see it as an opting out of council and some key community strategising. Um, if the staff were moved out. We also did a benchmarking exercise, so I looked at nine other urban authorities. Uh, none of them have contracted out to their community development teams. Um, there was quite a bit of surprise and shock, a little bit of horror expressed at the idea of that. Uh, not that that means that a council shouldn't do something different than others. Uh, when I looked at size of the team, it was certainly a, a relative, you know, it was a comparative sized team. Other teams are more clearly focused. They have more specific roles and clearer outcomes set by governance um, for their work. Um, so there was quite strong guidance and more governance oppor more opportunities for conversation between governance and community development in the way that they worked. That shows through particularly, I included a case study of Tauranga City Council, which I think has been doing some particularly um, constructive work in this area. 
So I guess key message from me, uh, community development central to council relationships with communities um, across the city. And I just put two, two phrases there, community development, bringing the mana of council to communities and bringing the voices of, of communities to council. Absolutely key. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much and thank you for all the time that you've put in it and um, your, your expertise that you brought to the table, your connections with the community. I've just got a couple of quick, quick ones myself. Um, it's two for staff and two for Bev. One, the one for staff on page 27, uh, that says there are no impl financial implications for the staff recommendation. Um, my question is, is that until, until and if we move staff? So if we move staff from Duke Street and place them somewhere else, there will be some financial considerations at that point in time. That's correct. Thank you. Just, just, I just think it's really important to flag that. Another question for staff, not that we shouldn't do it, by the way, I'm just, it's all about. Uh, and on page 13, in terms of to, in 2012 and immediately prior years, significant restructuring and cost cutting exercises reduced the size of the community development team. I have a little bit of information about that, but I'm wondering if we can get a, full, um, a fuller explanation of what happened at that time. Not necessarily today, but if it could be supplied to Council and about what was there before and what happened after and that kind of thing. Okay, that's the two for, and two for you if I could please, Bev. Um, I noted on page 31 of your, well, it's 31 of the Council report, uh, around um, your comments around sport Waikato and um, uh, creative Waikato and the like. Um, I was just wondering if you, if there was, it says the community development team could facilitate links between sport Waikato and the community houses for green prescriptions, for example. Um, and I wanted to know what you understood, what you meant by that and just um, whether the way that we deal with our green spaces and reserves would also be something at a strategic level that you're considering? Mm. Um, my view is that there's, there's quite a lot of work going already on already by the team in terms of how green spaces and parks and reserves are used. Um, and I think partly that's to do with the structure of um, where the team is located mm. inside council. Um, there's, I, I saw quite a number of examples of community development work is working with communities to make sure that parks are used well and so on. So I think there's quite a thread of that already. Whether that's whether it's clear to everybody that that's one of the priorities you want for them, yeah. uh, you know, might be another discussion. Um, in terms of the green prescriptions, so that was something, just a specific idea that came through um, in my conversations with Sport Waikato as an example of kind of on the ground work that were there better connections um, could be useful in the community. Because mm, you know, I know you also made comments about the um, uh, groups dealing with ageing in the community. Of course, that's now been taken over with the new age-friendly city plan. But nonetheless, you see there could be a greater interconnection between community development and those strategies. Absolutely. OK, thank you. And the last one will not surprise you to know, but I'm going to ask about the civic engagement and the relationship between governance and staff. Um, can you give me some examples? I, I'm very much a fan of greater civic engagement. I wonder. I want to know what that looks like in your view. There mm. is some detail, but presumably mm. you're suggesting we do more thinking in that area? Or? Mm. I think there are a number of possibilities. One is, um, and I think the team has already done quite a lot of this, is on the ground work, encouraging people to vote, working through places like community houses to do that, um, and thinking about you know, what parts of our demography um, do we need to pay attention to in terms of who doesn't tend to vote, um, but also around who engages um, in civic processes. Um, but I, I guess the opportunity that I see, and this is the kind of leadership that a community development team based in a council can play, is that there are a whole bunch of other organisations who are umbrellas in various ways for communities who are very interested in civic engagement. So Waikato Tainui, for example, mm. in terms of the hapu around the city, are very concerned at the lack of um, civic engagement of their people in Hamilton City. Um, and, and you'll be seeing that at a governance and representative level, but, but they are talking about it at all levels. Now, you've also got someone like Kote Pacifica talking about um, making sure that Pacific peoples um, are voting 
mm. you know, at the most basic level. So if you've already got a number of organisations talking about that, you know, there's a role for a community development worker to pull that together and think about how we have a city-wide strategy that is not driven by council, but actually driven by a range of organisations who provide leadership in different communities. Does that make sense? Yeah, so you think that also there could be some improvement between um, the good work that, say, the Division of Democracy and Governance do around long-term plans and such, the good work that Julie Clausen's doing at the moment, but you see that there could be greater um, interconnection with the community development teams because they, they know how those subsets of our community like to engage. Absolutely. What's likely to be successful in that space. Absolutely. So that's a really good example of what I'm talking about, about becoming more strategic inside council and therefore being able to work more strategically with communities. Okay, mm. thank you very much. That's me. The next question is Councillor Mallet. Thank you, and thank you, Bev. Um, I just found, I was a bit little concerned with the report in that it's, I found it very abstract rather than um, uh, results oriented, and I don't mean that the wrong way, but, uh, and, and for example, on page, uh, sorry, page 37 of our uh, report, um, there's community development workers noted their work is often driven by inappropriately short time frames, a lack of institutional understanding, blah, blah, blah. Wouldn't those sort of things be, um, do you know what I'm talking about? Do you know what I'm talking yeah. about? Yep. Uh, wouldn't yeah. that be resolved by simply having really clear articulated goals and processes to achieve those goals and, the, and you could measure people. And so you could say, okay, well, the community development um, uh, workers have no, no reason to be defensive or feel they've been put upon because they're achieving their goals. Yeah, if life is as simple as that. Um, well, it is, isn't it? <laughs> I, I, I won't go there, I think. Um, <clears throat> I guess, um, I mean, partly we're saying the same thing, I think, Gary. I think we're saying... You're saying there needs to be some quite clear focuses and strategies, and that's exactly what I'm saying. I was asked to do a piece of work that's about process, and so this is a process-oriented report. There's no doubt about that. And I am also really clear that community development isn't just about relationships and talking. They are fundamental to it, mm. but there need to be some outcomes identified. As to the nature of those outcomes, you know, the, the, it's very much true that this is an area in which... Um, not everything can be measured by numbers, for example. So we have to be really careful about having, um, for example, um, word-based outcomes described. I do think some clear... What-based? What word-based word oh. outcomes, yeah. So How else can we communicate the outcomes if we don't use words? Absolutely. It's just that I find when people tend to talk about um, measuring things, they're often switching to numbers for oh, some sorry, kinds of sorry, things, yeah. so, as, a, as opposed to numerical outcomes, mm -hmm. for example. Um, I, and I believe the team does need some clear outcomes um, and that the benefit of locating them more strategically will be that those outcomes will work for both communities and for council, and it's mm. finding that space, and they have a role in finding that space um, if they're allowed to do that. Okay. Uh, I mean, and a lot of your, not your problem, a lot of the problem might be that the United Nations defines community development as a process where community members come together to take collective action and generate solutions to common problems. Well, if that doesn't encompass everything, I don't know what else does. <laughs> Which is why um, governance guidance um, around focuses for that process yes. is important. OK. So the purpose of your report, I think, this is from what Debbie's told me, <laughs> um, was to determine whether or not we should, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, outsource or retain within um, uh, our own organisation the process of community development. Is that right? So the purpose of the council report and the decision that you have to make today yeah. is about whether we retain and keep within house or outsource. But the purpose of Bed's report had a wider um, purpose for us because we wanted her to input into how we might go about starting a strategic planning process for the team. Okay, so yep. um, and I don't mean this to be pointed at all. Bev's report is not really addressing the issue that we were tasked to make a decision on. Is that right? Am I wrong? It is addressing all of those issues. OK. All right. Um, I just wonder um, to what extent the whole process, the whole um, could be simplified if we could um, identify clear, articulate, 
goals and objectives, um, which from, from which would flow the processes you would use, and you could determine whether we've failed or um, exceeded our, or achieved our goals. I don't see much of that in any of this, um, which may or may not have been the purpose of this report. So I think the purpose of it is to give us a process in which we go about determining what those goals are, and part of that is to meet with our communities to ask them what goals are important for them as well. Yeah. So it's so she has given us advice and a recommendation about how we go about determining and how we get more focus, if that makes sense, Gary? Yep, I'm just not sure that it... Uh, OK, I'm not sure... I, all right, I've, I'm, and I haven't read the whole thing. I've read your abstract and a few other things and cherry-picked things that fit my agenda. Um, so I, I don't know. So maybe maybe that is in here, but uh, I, I couldn't find them. So, um, OK, thank you. So... Yeah, so I was going to say perhaps the solution to that is is for you to direct him to the parts of the report, or, and, and you can finish reading it at your leisure. Mm. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Councillor Ryan. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Chair, uh, Debbie and Bev. I found the report not abstract at all. I found it very comprehensive and a useful tool to give me context. Um, so thank you for that. Um, just... Obviously, this is one of the um, United Nations things, but you've touched on it a little bit. I just wondered if you could provide a little bit of clarity, which was around broader sustainable development goals. Did, did you have any thought on that? Sorry, that's on page three, page 30 of our report. Um, and so obviously, sustainable development's a really important um, concept because of the Local Government Act um, currently. And given changes that are likely to happen around the four well-beings, for example, um, being able to talk in those terms, in those broad terms, is quite important. So, um, and I did include in the appendix what the United Nations Sustainable Goals are, so that gives you an idea of the range. I think the important thing about using the concept of sustainable development is that it moves us away from the idea that community development is about social services. It moves us into um, broader community um, vision um, alongside council. Um, which can be around, you know, whatever the significant issues are for a city. Um, so they can be environmental factors, they can be cultural factors, they might be around gender, they might be around civic engagement. Could be very specific things, uh, could be around child poverty, could be housing action, could be, uh, I'm working in a number of spaces at the moment where there are converse conversations going on nationally, regionally and locally around um, reducing our youth su suicide rates, for example. This city could decide, actually, we don't want any more um, suicides um, of young people in our city. We're going to set a zero target. And, uh, you know, this is just completely off the top of my head. So, you know, it's not that I'm suggesting that it is the focus you ought to have, but as an example. Um, you know, different agencies working in different space, who pulls all of those together? Um, who, who um, from both a governance level at council, who speaks that... Um, visionary kind of talk that changes what happens on a day-to-day -day basis for young people. Um, and there's some very specific things, because people jump off buildings and, you know, so there are things that happen that um, are quite specific to council in that space as well. Okay, thank you. You touched on quite a key thing, I think, which was to strengthen the link between governance, council and the community and the outworking of the team. Do you think that's a strategy approach, or is it a person that is that link? Hmm, good question. Um, I think it's a strategy approach and making sure that everybody is working in that way is probably the most effective way to do that. Um, and that may mean orienting some roles specific um, to do that. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, thank you. Could I just make a comment on that, just from my point of view? Um, I think it's about... Um, staff working closer with the elected members with the um, issues, opportunities and information and trends that are, the community advisors bring back through Andy's reports and th through all the um, community network meetings we have and a whole bunch of other information we get from central government. And then actually getting real clarity around this table and I'm including senior management uh, around what are the priorities for the staff to concentrate on? Is it around 
around election time is that the democratic process and Andy's team have been involved in that, encouraging people to vote and those sorts of things. Some issues we heard this morning, there's some safety issues, there's um, issues around housing. Peter talked about um, people who are sleeping rough and the great work they do. What, what are the things that we, in our role as local government, actually concentrate on so that our staff have clarity? Because I think Gary br brought up a good um, point that it's, you know, it's, quite, it's quite wide. It could be quite wide. So w where are we going to get the best um, return on our, our investment? I know that's a bit of a crude way of putting it, and I think Bev's right. It's not just about numbers and money. It's about Social people. investment. Yeah, exactly. So, and, you know, we, we've got limited resources just like everyone has, and, you know, all the great groups that we work with and help fund at times. Um, so, so it's about getting that clarity, and I think it's about having the regular conversation here and, and actually, um, I would say, in my view, would be that uh, getting more elected member involvement in that, um, with that contextual information. So I think, you know, talking to Bev and staff and Andy's team and Debbie, I think that would be, staff would find that really useful. We've got a process which Richard will share with elected members around um, just how we're getting alignment right across the council, um, across and up and down, vertically and horizontally, just in everything we want to achieve, which links back to our three outcomes around a Great River City, et cetera, et cetera, which is um, our many outcomes which you guys have ticked off. So I think that would be a really important step um, to start with. Very good. Just quickly, two more. Um, uh, the Duke Street Depot, perhaps, Debbie, you might have a bit of comment on that, or Bev, is that we're sort of looking to maybe that's reached its point of? Um, my view is that um, it's not great having the team at Duke Street. I think um, if we if you really want them to work strategically across all of the interests of council, they need to be based centrally with council, with other council staff, um, and so. Um, of the view that they need to be together as a team, that's really important to them, um, and for the effectiveness of their work. They also need to be more accessible to members of the community. When you talk with other key people in the community sector, you know, they say, what are they doing at Duke Street? No, we, we don't go there, we don't want to go there, we don't actually know where it is, and feel like the right kind of place to go. Yeah. Um, and so moving the team, I, I guess I also think it's, there's some risk for council in having them there, both in terms of how the team are perceived by the council, but also how they're perceived, sorry, by the community, but also how they're perceived by other strategic parts of council. Sure. Debbie, do you have a quick comment on that one? Or? Yeah, so we've been looking at options um, around that for a while. We were just waiting for the outcomes of Bev's report, and then I'd like to start that strategic work and then start okay. looking at our options for moving. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's all in hand. Thank you. And thanks for your financial um, handout. Just a quick one on that. Um, the grants you've talked about at 1.222. Yeah. And is that the grants that Andy referred to this morning, the 850, does that come out of that? So we have two sets of grant. we have grants. We have single-year grants and multi-year grants. So part of what Andy is referring to today is one subset of that. Is that the 850? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Councillor O'Leary. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thanks, Bev. It's a, I found the report really uh, very, very thorough. Um, nothing short of what I expected from you, given your um, experience. A few questions. Um, Bev, is it your view that the strategy will give, well, I think it is from the report, will give direction to the work that's already being done by the unit um, to give clarity to, to not only the organisation but the community. But is it also out of that strategy, will, will new things come about? Or is it just um, kind of to bundle up what we're doing now so that we're all driving in the same direction? What's the balance kind of there of something new might come out of it or just actually capturing what we're doing now? I think that depends a great deal on um, the governance conversations that you have, actually. Um, I, I think there is some bundling up of what happens now and being clear about it. There's some, some disconnect, perhaps, in understanding what each is doing and what's important to each. Um, so some of it is bundling up, but there might be some new things that come out. There might, and part of that is there needs to be some careful analysis of, in that process of, you know, not what is the community saying is important, but 
who's already doing what and where is there a space for a community development worker from council to play a significant role. Um, so it's not taking on everything and anything that's possible. Yeah. It's identifying where community development, which is located in a local authority, can make a significant impact. Um, and that requires some, some careful analysis of possible focuses. The reason, I, the reason I ask that is in the extra handout sheet we got under the status quo, for years one, two and three, I noticed there are no increase to that, those costs. And I'm assuming that uh, budgets, as all budgets do, have increases over time. So I'm wondering if, Debbie, if you can just comment on that. Yeah, so the, the one thing that is missing from those budgets is, is inflation. Yeah. Yeah. Or if something comes out of a new strategy of a new work stream or something that's going to require a new budget. I, mean, I know we're going to do it then, but we're, we're on the pre precipice of an LTP. So I, I, I guess what I'm, what I'm asking is that, depending on the um, outcome of today, we have, to be, we have to have eyes wide open here because often new strategies and come round to the governance table, then we're all throwing ideas and all sorts of things that we want to achieve in. Yeah, that's correct. Um, I'd just also like to point out that we do have a way of working in community development where we, we work in partnership with others, mm. which often means that we're supporting those organisations to apply for funding from philanthropic sources, which does cost to council very low. So um, traditionally, um, the investment from council has been primarily staff time, and that is still a very effective way of working for us. Yeah. And still on those figures, Debbie, in the year one, um, on the far right column, contract out individually, um, do I take the first year being uh, 1.7 million and then it drops down to those uh, sort of set up costs, because these are contracting out? Is that so what if, it is? if you're referring to the one where we'd contract out individually and reduce the salaries, yeah. there's a big cost in year one because there would be redundancy costs. Oh, redundancy costs. Okay, yeah. so there's no set up costs. Um, and just a question, either to you or Lance, probably to you, do you? Um, in terms of the Duke Street Depot, surely, depending on the uh, committee's decision today, relocating staff back into the building, I mean, that's an operational decision that you'll make, isn't it? That's not a strategic planning decision. Yeah, I think we just want to make sure that our location lines up with what our strategic thinking is, yeah. but it's an easy one to implement yeah. relatively quickly. There are yeah. spaces that we can... Go. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, that's all. Thanks, Madam Chair. I'll move when you're ready. The staff recommendation. Thank you. I'll, I'll be the seconder for that. Um, Councillor um, Deputy Gallagher. Um, yes. Obviously, congratulations on an excellent report, and also it was really useful yes, with yes. regard to the summary of the major other players out there. Given the fact that this council has moved away from the mayoral advisory groups, which we had in the past, we had an older persons advisory, youth advisory advisory. Um, where do you see um, the community development team in terms of portfolios ensuring that the messages from the key groups that you've actually listed in the work they're doing are adequately communicated to us? So for, I'll, I'll take Creative Waikato. Good example. Before we had a, a, a advisory group which advised the Mayor and respect, great respect to their work. However, going direct to Creative Waikato is the sort of umbrella group where, where there's no holds bars and they will tell it as they said. Is there's no sort of niceties, bang. I think that's useful. But it's, it's what, is, what I'm sort of wanting to tease out here is how we better get that and ensure that we have that intelligence from, from groups that are set up and have their own mandate to coordinate, for example, arts and culture. Mm, so a range of conversations are needed, mm. aren't they? And, and I don't think that you want community development to workers to always be your go-between. Mm -hmm. You know, as councillors, you want to be speaking with key mm. organisations mm. or be mm. at key events mm. that give you your own intelligence. Mm. What we're talking about is being strategic because the intelligence that you all gather is matched with the intelligence that community development workers gather. Mm. Um, and together, we're figuring things out. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that... Um, made a difference for focusing the work of the group is that um, there, there used to be some strategies, and I'm thinking of the what was the social social well-being, social well-being strategy, for example. 
in place that did mm. give some clear focuses, and those things have dropped away. Now, where there is a clear strategy, and it seems that city safety is an example of that from what I heard this morning, then it's quite clear what work the team should be doing and are doing. But where there isn't a strategy in place, you know, then it's much less clear. Um, and I, so there's a decision for you as a governance group around how best to be part of that strategy setting um, and whether that requires you to speak widely, just as the community development team are doing, or whether you make use of key organisations like Creative Wild Sport Waikato. And in those spaces, they are such key organisations with such wide networks, they're an obvious place to go. So I guess the other thing would be intelligence. I'll take the Richmond Park School as a good example. With respect, with respect, I felt councillors had to be pretty proactive to this under the previous government's all changed now, lovely yeah. new government, but under the previous government, um, and probably under the current one, there's an issue there's a property issue. So the Minister of Education just saw that purely as a surplus property issue. We saw it as a community development issue. And how how do we uh, and maybe Debbie will ask, you know, because what I'm looking for is that early intelligence of, you know, what is the ministry thinking? What is their thought pattern? At what point do we need to get the phone to Jamie Strange and the Honourable Nanama Uta? To, to get a high level political uh, bef before the sort of ministry, for example, declare that property surplus, where we know through the community development there's a whole lot of <coughs> local needs. So I think, and I've discussed with mm. this with you before, is um, what would be good to establish as well as determining a strategic focus, but also how we wish to communicate with one another, mm. because um, there are some challenges in that space mm. now. So. I think it's 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 about um, having a process that the team can escalate those things and a mechanism for doing that. So that's something I think we also need to work on. Which leads us in terms of the governance side because that, that whole interchange. So for example, Richmond Park, the, the, the exciting uh, proposals around the Pan Pacifica hub and how we can help and the work we're already doing, not just you know, with our, across our different departments and how how is that formally you know, regularly communicated in terms of intelligence? that as an elected member, without jumping in your pocket, I know exactly what you're doing, you know, in another room, rather than, say, here at third hand. And, and I think I'm just interested in both of you in terms of the community space. How could we improve, you know, both ways, how that's reported around the table, obviously how we report to you, even stuff that we're doing as elected members. Mm. So um, the report that came through the GM's mm. report today, was that a helpful mm. source of information for you? Yes, I think so. And I think personally to grow the GM report, uh, you know, and that's good. I mean, I think we, we have good today. But, I mean, I would see as part of... I'm asking you the question, please say yes or no, this is the question. I would see the community development team playing quite a key role in terms of that you know, that intelligence out there? Yes. The issues yep. that we should be across? Yes, agreed. And, mm. and often they do have intelligence. I think it's it's just the way that that gets communicated. I think we just mm. need to have mechanisms that allow mm. allow the staff to do that. Dr Gatenby, um, the issue of the location, we, we talked about Duke Street. Your report is trending back to bring them back into this building in terms of physical locality. Obviously the question uh, is that previously our community would have been located in, in different hubs, community houses, where, where do you see that kind of mix? Because you have, they're here to help influence the, what we do, but then the issue of being out there is in terms of visibility. It shouldn't just be community workers that have visibility, obviously, but your view on, on that in terms of location? Mm, um, and I expected that most people would say, you that I spoke with from the community yeah. sector would say, you know, we want them out here but actually they said we want them in council and clearly in council and bringing with it council relationships and resources and, and authority. And we are located as kind of the, the symbol of that in lots of ways. Um, and there were concerns, you know, apart from a couple of people, there were concerns that when community development workers are located in a particular community setting, it becomes unclear who they are working for. Um, say though is that I think there are particular times when you do want to locate a community development worker outside of council around particular projects so and I this came, there was an interesting example from um, Hutt City Council actually where they were planning a um, 
significant community hub development in a particular street. And they wanted, they wanted really strong input from the local community. So they based a community development worker in an empty shop down the road for six months. Um, and they put, you know, big signs everywhere and we're here from this time to this time, come and talk to us. And they had an ex extraordinary number of people come in and talk about that. Now that's a time when it is useful to locate someone for a very specific reason um, in another location. In general, people want the staff to be clearly in council. And, they did, and while they saw Duke Street as a barrier to um, accessibility to the community, um, they didn't see, you know, Caro Street as a barrier to that. I use the Western Community Centre as a hub, also Paketi, the ones I'm, as yep. a West Ward, sort of familiar with. But, but you know, that, they obviously had a presence in those areas. Is, is there a bit of a mix and match in terms of the hot desk? Because it, it seems to me that if I'm sort of sitting in, you know, I know Neil's in the room, he can't comment, but if I'm sitting in Neil's position, I think... Would I not want some hot desk where I actually had a liaison point? You know, mm. people, you know, some community workers who totally understood the micro communities of North Horseshoe, mm. etc. Mm. You know, and that, that obviously that community is mega different from, say, the micro community in Rotatuna. Mm. That's right. Um, I wondered about that too. It mm. seemed like a kind of a midpoint that might work. Yeah. I guess the feedback from. Um, from the community development workers is that when they've tried that, it's been isolating. Um, in fact, they've sat at a desk and, and um, you know, because they've said they'd be there in a certain space at a certain time and anyone can come in and, and they've hoped that there's all this extra benefit from the other people around um, the setting that, that will make a difference in terms of the community connections, but it hasn't worked. And then from the community sector organisations themselves, you know, they, they it wasn't something that came through as as being particularly useful. Final question, um, and again, you'd probably be loath to pick the ideal Paradise Council. And I know every, like obviously Christchurch social makeup is utterly different from Hamilton social makeup. I've always looked at Christchurch as the sort of the bit of a role model in terms of their community engagement. But I was really mm. intrigued. Thank you for telling me about Tauranga. Mm. You know, we we make assumptions that Tauranga is X. But there's a far more, you know, I was really interested in that and how they're evolving. Is there any kind of rough cities that are more leading in this space than others, or, or do they all have something to offer? Uh, Christchurch and Tauranga are probably the two that you've identified, mm. I think, actually. But in, in Christchurch, what I'd be looking at is how the governance structures make a difference to that community engagement. Yeah. Um, you know, because you have... I mean, it's a much larger city, so there's some structural issues around that. But the community boards and the way in which community development work is linked to the community mm -hmm. boards gives it um, a great deal of focus. Without dragging you into the work that Leanne and team are doing around our, our ward system and representation, a really interesting presentation the other day, which I... Is there sort of a challenge... You know, how, how do we better connect with different communities? It might be a community board, it might be you know, stronger community hub. I, I don't know. It's probably outside your brief, but um, mm. if you were... Uh, I personally live in Waipa, and yes. um, community boards in Waipa, yeah. um, and so I've been interested watching that. I think they do make a difference, in my view, mm. for, thank you know, for an off top of my head, very yeah, broad sure. statement. No. Yeah. Thank you. OK, thank you very much for that line of questioning. Uh, Mayor King. Can I ask the mover and the seconder to consider a D to the recommendation. I'll just get it up on the board. Yeah. Is that your that's your question? Thank, thank you, Thank you. King. Angela moved. Yes. Um, Councillor Henry. Um, just a clear, well, it's not really clarification. Just a question uh, of thank you for that awesome report, and, and it was really great to talk to you as well, and, and to, to you, Debbie. And I just get this feeling talking about this, and I might be totally wrong, but um, that that it really needs an overarching strong vision from us as well. 
to to really guide guide our community development team. Is that right? I mean, you talked about you know we've got like the zero road death and and zero mission for suicide and so on. There's so many missionary things, and it's it's a high level. So is that something? That's what I'm hearing. Is that we should really have? Yes. Okay. That's all I want to know. Awesome. Thank you. We'll thank work you on that. <laughs> thank you, Councillor Henry. Councillor Casson. Um, yeah, thank you, Bev, for your comprehensive report, and thank you, Debbie, for the presentation. Um, just a couple of questions. So, if we um, probably to one could answer, I suppose. Um, if we contracted out um, our advisors, would Hamilton uh, City Council would they lose oversight and quality control on their performances? Um, you can write some of those things into the contract, but it is less flexible. So there is loss of control, yes. Okay. Um, and last question. Um, would you see there to be any benefit in um, Hamilton City Councillors actually accompanying our community advisors out and about in the community? And um, if so, uh, at, at different meetings, and if so, um, how could it benefit uh, council as a whole and the community? Yeah, I think there definitely are benefits. And just thinking back to the example of the Rototona safety meeting, um, there was a community, obviously I was there and a community advisor were there. I think that there are, um, there's mutual support that can be provided between members and staff in those situations, um, and also um, enable staff to assist with some of the follow-up concerns from those communities. So I guess that's also then how it goes on to benefit the community. Yeah, so definitely, yes, I see that. That would be a good thing to happen. Cool. I thought that would be the answer. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Casson. Thank you, and thank you, Bev and Debbie, for your great work. Um, <clears throat> I noticed, I was just looking at the, the people you interviewed and talked to as community leaders, etc. They all seem to be recipients of uh, grants and funds, etc. But there didn't seem to be a lot of dialogue, I couldn't find it, with uh, the likes of the Well Trust, Trust Waikato, and the funders who, who are doing a tremendous work and momentum in commissioning vital signs and driving community development. Um, could you speak to that, or were they absent for a reason? Or uh, I didn't choose to speak with um, the philanthropic um, organisations, and I, I could have added that. It would have increased the scope of the report um, in some ways, and we were working with a budget. That's not the only reason. Um, it's not a surprise that the groups I spoke with are all groups that you fund because mm. they are the key organisations in the city. So, you know, that, that they are who they are. Um, I guess, um, and perhaps I could have made this clearer, when I said that there are a whole bunch of cities <coughs> around the city that you could actually draw on to help you develop focus for this work, um, I'm actually thinking of some of those philanthropic organisation strategies, um, mm. and I think that's where um, you could really draw on the conversations that they have already had. Now, the, the other side of that, though, is that I know that those organisations also struggle to have um, enough staff, even though they're philanthropic organisations, to actually do really significant analysis of communities, and that's where Council actually has some resource that is useful for those philanthropic organisations. You have people who can look at... Um, the demographics, who can look at um, central and local policy and draw all of that together. Um, uh, you know, there, there is a con to draw this conversation wider, there is a conversation going on at the Waikato plan level around um, the possibility of a, um, a, this may or may not happen, um, there's a debate around it, but the possibility of a, a policy office. One of the things that we do lack in this region and inside Hamilton City is a collaboratively agreed set of information about our city um, and about what the issues are here. And so organisations like those philanthropic trusts have to, with, with limited numbers, try and find it and pull it from different places. Now, Council provides some of that with your um, community profiles and social indicators report, but it's at quite a... Um, it's not a particularly detailed level, um, and so... You know, that's a space where using their strategies, but then also agreeing as strategies across the city, this is the kind of information that we need and that we'll all commit to putting together, which we can then all use to build big vision for the city. Yeah, then, um, well, they, they might be a bit lacking in resources, some of them. Some of them have got bigger staff than others, but um, they've got the money. And they so have... they are influencing, you know, where the community's going a lot. So, you know, as they say, 
focus goes, energy flows? Yes, it's always worth remembering that, yes, they have money, um, as does council, and actually the amounts of money that they give out... Big call, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, well, the amounts of money that they give out are... You know, you have to think about that in terms of um, the amount of investment that council has as mm. well. Mm. Yeah. OK. No, yeah. thank you, Tara. Councillor Pascoe. Yeah, thanks. thanks, Bev, for your detailed report. Um, just a question about D. I'm just querying the grammar uh, that reports are provided to the Community and Services Committee until they are satisfied. Is they are, does that mean the committee or does that mean the staff and and Dr Bev Gattenby? Um, I'm just w wondering who, who is going to be satisfied yeah. that we have the Community Development Service fully implemented. I think the assumption is this council, so we should just change that until council. it is satisfied. Until it is satisfied? Yeah. It is satisfied. Thank you. I understand. Fully. Has been, has been, yeah. I missed that one. Yeah. Perfect. That's a good thank teamwork, you. producers. Okay, thank you. So um, we've had all the questions. We'll go into. Staff work with Bev Gate and me. Have we got a budget there? Yeah, the budget's on page um, 73. So th this is additional work, isn't it? Is it or not? Correct, that would be additional work which is not budgeted for currently. Obviously, everything's budgeted for <coughs> apart from um, Bev's work, Bev's time that she'll be spending on it. But the overall budget, I presume, is under status quo. Is that right, uh, Dr Gattenby? Or so the status quo budget is for the service as it is now. We wouldn't have budget for Bev's time to um, continue working with us to implement. Yeah. Yep. But I understand it'll only be Bev's time. Correct. Thank you. Um, on that so just what so is the answer so staff, that? So staff can find that money within mm -hmm. current budgets, moving things about just to, to ensure that Bev's time is paid for? Or is this a substantial issue? Uh, well, I don't think it's substantial when you look at the whole of Council's budget. So um, it's something that we'll just have to manage within our, the overall budget across my group. So, And I don't think it's... Bev's, um, my experience, is pretty efficient in the way she works So, and has a reasonable rate. Um, so um, we'd work with her to make sure that it's, you know, it's, it wouldn't be a significant figure, so I think we can cover it. OK, thank you. That's answered the question. We'll go into debate. Councillor O'Leary, you're the mover. Thank you, Madam. Right, there we go. <laughs> Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, uh, fantastic report, uh, full of um, excellent information, and nothing the, in the report really surprised me. Um, community development is, I believe, certainly um, in an overall a holistic view undervalued from a day-to-day -day basis because we don't really get to see day-to-day -day the value that the community development team uh, provide for the city and for those organisations that they work for. Um, some of us see one facet of that, that uh, when we go to events and activities during the week, uh, during uh, weeknights and in weekends, and we see uh, some of the community development staff out and about at those events and activities and the strength and value of the relationships they have with people in the city is, uh, is significant. Um, the, I, I support the next step very much. That's the key for me um, in that we'll be able to capture everything that we're doing and actually have a strategy going um, forward and into the future. And uh, the key, also the key about that for me is that we will integrate the work that the community development team into our thinking, into our policy making and into other uh, strategies. So excellent report, I really appreciate your, your work. We're very lucky to be able to have you working on such an important part of council. And thanks Debbie as well for all of your work. Thank you very much, Councillor Casson. Oh, look, this is something we should be investing in as a, as a Hamilton City Council. Our um, community advisors give us really good bang for buck and uh, our, our uh, contact with the community out there. Um, 
the an arm of Hamilton City Council for um, uh, community engagement and enabling our communities to um, achieve wants and goals out there in the community. And um, you know, it, it actually um, the community advisors by having them as a as a group uh, kind of mirrors uh, what we had in the uh, in the police with our community councils in 2013, where um, community councils uh, like talking at Flagstaff. I was in control of the, uh, the Flagstaff, Tarapa, Hamilton East and um, Chartwell community constables and they all came together at the end of the day in a certain um, hub at Flagstaff and dispersed in the morning to go out and do their work. So you actually when they come in back together you get that going on, um, yeah, the pooling of knowledge and um, identifying emerging trends and everything else. So um, I think it is vitally important to keep our community advisors uh, in-house and also to have a central hub where they do actually come back to to uh, share their knowledge and everything else. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor uh, Deputy Mayor Gallagher. Yes. Um, yeah, thank you for the report, Dr. Gatenby. That's very helpful and obviously um, very comprehensive. And I also appreciate your, your comprehensive uh, consultation. Uh, obviously, I'm aware that the uh, current government now is proposing to amend. Uh, the Local Government Act to reintroduce the social wellbeings and obviously uh, I would be asking that we actually you know, look at that and see what further implications that, that has for us in terms of expectation. Uh, obviously there are broader issues of funding and how we, we, we fund local government. What I am actually pleased however, and I'm not in any way with any ill spirit looking at past events, I am so pleased that we have a community development committee back as a committee of the whole, as a standing committee, having uh, chaired the community forum. And I'm not. I'm just saying that I think we've moved to a much better uh, a place. And and I think that uh, this resolution gives us a chance, as this particular focus of our work in council, to to continually focus uh, on the work um, that we are doing. I think one of the critical points we just made before, Dr. Gatenby around the information, you know, different people problems. Now, heavens above, we, we have a $1.3 billion DHB budget. We have the University of Waikato, uh, ourselves and others, stats. So it seems to me that really crucial how the groups get together and, and you know, there's a massive um, professional uh, expertise. So I think obviously I have a challenge loud and clear how we need to ensure that that, you know, we all come off the same page in terms of collective information, in terms of micro detail about a neighbourhood, the overall population trends, uh, you know, where things are moving. And I think that's something that I would very strongly encourage us we continue to um, uh, work ahead with. And um, I just also um, want to say that I'm looking forward to kind of the fine tuning. And I think it's probably, Debbie, through the, the GM's report that we do get uh, as account up-to-date trends, not just from your, you know, it's not just your department, it shouldn't all fall on your area, but you know, across that. So just as we kind of have the, the bricks and infrastructure trends from the GM report to, to growth and infrastructure, we make sure we get those social things uh, in this area. So I will be uh, strongly supporting the recommendation and uh, thank uh, Dr. Gatenby and your team for the work that you do. Thank you, Councillor Mallet. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, I'll be supporting this uh, 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 motion, but I do have concerns that um, we spend an awful lot of ratepayers' money on this field. Um, I'm just very, very concerned that I question the rigour to which we um, put that money spent in terms of what 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 sort of outcome we get, and James um, James said it really nicely. You know, what bang are we getting for our buck? Um, I'm really concerned that I don't think we have um, spent enough time at looking at what we want to achieve, what the goals are, um, and and that was my argument earlier on. Um, we spend a lot of time in council looking at you know our capital projects and whether we're achieving them or not, whether our where we're balancing our books and things like that. Um, but to give a pass is probably too harsh a, a way of phrasing it, but if you get what I mean, that um, we don't seem to be put the same sort of rigour in um, assessing how we, uh, what sort of bang for the buck we are getting in this particular area. Now, I know it's a difficult area, 
it's about, well, the UN said it's about everything. Um, but uh, it, it is a difficult area to measure, and you're talking about people. Um, but I, I just, I, you know, I'm, I'm very concerned, you know, the long story short, you know, this is one of those things that's further away from core services than the stuff that I, uh, I approve of. But I will be supporting this. Um, but I do hope that we can, somewhere on the line, find out a, a way whereby we can actually see if it's working or not. Because I don't know that we've even got a mechanism to determine whether or not it's working. Um, I haven't seen a clear uh, description of the problem. And I'd love to see a clear description of the problem. And then some method of measuring whether we're going some way towards improving things or not. Because we are spending millions of dollars on this. Um, and as we all know, we're in a very money-constrained environment. Thank you. Councillor Henry. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, look, I, I understand Councillor Mallard, and um, uh, and it's probably not very so well quantifiable what's happening out there. Um, and I just question what bang for the buck do we get for Claudelands and the other stadia? Mm -hmm. So I think we have a lot more. Um, um, we we've got a lot more influence on more people um, this way than we will have with any of our stadiums. So uh, that's just my opinion. Um, look, but I, I do agree with what, with most what has been said already. And um, but what I'm really excited about is that that uh, community workers come back into this building um, because. Um, it's all about, to me, it's all about bumping, and the more you bump into people, the more you, you uh, exchange ideas, um, um, visions, and so on, and, um, and I think it's, it's really important for the, for the community workers to bump into us as well, and not just out there, um, where we see them at, at um, social gatherings and so on. Um, so, and, but I have to say they're doing a great job. I was just there yesterday at um, at um, the uh, what was it Pack and Save, uh, where they're standing outside talking to people about um, the the ten year plan and and the public consultation. An awesome team. I mean, I have to. I just put a plug in there. Just awesome. So um, th that's what I'm excited about. Um, I also have to say uh, what um, Councillor Leary said. Um, it is really important going forward with a clear strategy that uh, they know and we know where we're going with, with this. And, um, and I'm glad that, um, Bev, you, you, you're still staying on with, your, <laughs> with all your no knowledge and expertise. So. Um, Really looking forward to to working on this more and and seeing some some amazing outcomes for this city because we do need a clear vision and it, it's not just about problems it is about seeing a, a positive and and um, um, yeah moving forward uh, vision. Thank you, Councillor Bunting. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'll be supporting uh, this motion. Um, thank you for your work on these uh, these reports. Uh, as far the, it's, it's a no-brainer for me having these people involved. They are extra ears uh, for us at a governance level. They are extra hands and they are extra mouthpieces as well. Um, I would like to see more of them in these meetings so that the, the messages are clear. There's not the Chinese whispers between the governance and the, and the community. So I can't see any harm in having a good, strong, stable um, in-house force um, and I would like to see them used a little bit more. They tie in extremely well uh, with our council that is best in business community outcome as well. Um, and we've got to remember that is, to a degree, a guiding document when it comes to this kind of thing. Um, uh, and that is our council is customer focused. Um, we can't be everywhere at every event. Um, and granted, around the 10 year plan time, we're getting lobbied. Uh, we're getting hammered, we're getting threatened. Um, and these people are, are getting some really good dialogue with, through their good, um, good networks. An example of that is the great work they did around the Dominion Park um, security issue. They, they achieved outcomes that we couldn't have done. So, um, yeah, no, all strength to you, and I look forward to working with you in the future. Councillor Pascoe. Oh. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, look, I'm, I'll also be supporting the motion. Um, I think the focus and the timing of this uh, very, very good is about right, given the four well-beings that this current government, central government, uh, are... are uh, are returning to. Um, there's no doubt in my mind, though, with the appetite around this council, that the four well-beings will cost ratepayers more. And 
So I think this ongoing work, which is um, covered in Part D of the of the motion, uh, needs to be mindful of making sure that um, the outcomes will provide effective and efficient service and service that's targeted to what the community really needs. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor King. Uh, yes, it is our job to run the city with financial, financial prudence, but we also need to have a heart for, for the well-being of our community and for the vulnerable. And these are our community, our social and our pastoral workers. And it's fantastic to see that part of this report recommends moving them out of an industrial area in the back of Frankton and bring them here back into the CBD. And I think that's sending a strong message of value for these people. Thank you. Councillor Ryan, uh, Councillor Hamilton, sorry. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I have to, I have to I smile, but agree with Councillor Siggy on the bump concept and um, Bunty on best service. I mean, that's that actually does make it sound core business when you talk like that. And yeah, we've heard from passionate front lines uh, people this morning, Peter Humphreys and Neil Tolan and others, um, talking about the proactive nature of good community engagement at at grassroots level. And I think this is a really exciting opportunity to not only continue it, but actually strengthen that. Uh, we talk often about civic in involvement or voter apathy and things like that. And the stronger our engagement is with community, I think this is part of that answer. Um, and to dismantle or weaken the structure further would create more isolated, fragmented community groups, which would exacerbate criminal activity and those sorts of things as have been alluded to. So even though the nuts and bolts financials may not be ever 100% forthcoming, I think it's fairly obvious that this has a significant benefit to our community and I don't think many ratepayers would struggle with um, what they're getting in return for it. Thanks. Thank you. Before we go to the rush play, I'll just uh, make a few comments myself. Um, I strongly disagree with Councillor Mallet, as you can imagine on this, uh, the core business aspect about this. This is fundamentally core business of the City Council. Um, we are here to look after the people that live here and that are the communities that live within our city. Um, I mean, let's be reasonable. If our communities, doesn't matter how big or grand our city gets in the way of infrastructure or buildings, if our people are not well, if they don't feel whole and they're not happy, what kind of a city is that? I commend the staff for um, the community development team uh, for all that they do. I'm out and about alongside them quite often in this role. And I can tell you they do add significant value to the widest group of people that you can imagine. And, as the Mayor rightly commented on, the most vulnerable at times. So they're adding value out there. I know that without a shadow of doubt. And is there a problem out there? Yes, there is, because we do have vulnerable people. We do have, for example, we went to a citizenship recently and welcomed 120 new people to our city who do have needs that need to be met. They need access to language, to skills learning, to support in their communities. And if we do that right, we make the whole city stronger. Um, I'm really excited about the report because um, I do believe in community-led development and I think the community development team are working in that space, but I look forward to investigating how we can go beyond working alongside the community to helping them lead their future and the outcomes that they need. So that, to me, is about power to the people. I think there was a programme about that a long time ago. Um, uh, the other comment I want to make, the other part that I'm quite excited about is um, public participation. I was really pleased to hear Councillor O'Leary asked the question of staff this morning, how many submissions we've got to the long-term plan, and finally we've got over 420-something or thereabouts, which is, which is heartening. Still very low, though, when you consider how big our city is and how many rateable properties and how many residents there are. It's still really, really low. We're sort of, co of course, constrained by the Local Government Act about what constitutes consultation. People 
to write in a submission to Council for it to be formally considered. But we all know that we're out and about all the time working alongside the communities, gathering intelligence about what they need and, and how they can help. And I think that's really important. And I'd really like to explore that whole area a lot more. How can we improve public engagement in civic affairs? Because that's where the rubber hits the road. That's where we, as councillors, are making decisions that are going to have huge impact on them for the next three, nine, and beyond years. So, I um, yeah, no, I think this is, is pretty excited. I won't repeat what Rob said about the four well-beings, but because I do work on a um, policy advisory group in Wellington, I can tell you that people are very, very focused at redressing the balance where uh, all roads were leading to economic well-being. Now, social well-being is getting put back on the radar, and that's where it should be. So. Um, delighted to see the report. I hope that this report keeps getting opened very often and we keep referring to it. Thank you very much, Bev, for all your work. I know not only have you done a very professional job, but your heart and soul is really into this work as well, so that I also appreciate. Thank you. I surprised myself. I forgot about Angela with your right of reply. <laughs> I'll be brief. Look, crude accounting methods can't and shouldn't and are not appropriate for a measure for human connections and community relationships. And with a good, strong strategy, we'll, we'll know if this works because people will tell us and the communities will show us. Community development is an investment in people and people are our core service. We are local government and we are for the people. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to the vote on the board, please. The motion was carried unanimously. Thank you. Thank you very much, councillors. Thank you for that good debate. Thank you, Bev. We look forward to working further with you. Thank you, Debbie, for the good report. Now we've got two. We've got two. I'm not quite sure. Sure, I'm in your hands because I think there might be some discussion. But will there be any detailed discussion around the community assistance policy? I do think the civil defence and emergency update can probably be taken as as read, um, largely. Would councillors, do you feel like you need a break for lunch at this point? break before the briefing. So we'll try and get through both those items in the next half an hour and stop for lunch at one and have a decent stretch before the workshop. So the next item is in fact, so stay put, stay put, thank you, is um, Andy with the Community Assistant Policy. Thank you. It's moved by Councillor O'Leary, seconded by Councillor Casson. Pardon? What's that? I didn't. Okay, do you mind, Councillor Casson, if Councillor Henry seconds? Oh. It doesn't worry, Councillor Casson, so you are now the second to Councillor Henry. And I'm sure you both have the same intent with this. Okay, so Andy, do you need to make any points on this, or are, you, are we largely taking it as. Uh, Councillors, I'll, I'll take it as read. I just do want to highlight the fact that um, as the conversations you guys have probably been involved in around the city, uh, our philanthropic partners are fairly strong in their vocal articulation that they think we should be investing more in terms of our community grants. As you've heard from some of our recipients today, that's actually coming from our philanthropic partners as well. And I know you will have lots of conversation through the 10-year plan, but I just wanted to again say from the allocation committee, they wanted me to articulate that to you guys today. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Can I just add one uh, on number 12, just a matter of fact, uh, while it says seven voting members, I have to say, having sat through the single-year grant and the multi-year grant, voting did not occur. What happened was a systemic ranking that um, the councillors didn't involve themselves in the ranking per se. That was done by the, t the independents, and out of that came some pref preferences, and then there was discussion, and all 
questions were reached by quite by consensus methods so not voting consensus methods and a lot and a lot of conversation to get to some of them but voting kind of gives a slightly wrong impression of how that process want, ran and I just wanted to put that straight thank you councillor you gone councillor Mallet you gone on page 91 uh, you've got a list of the successful applicants. Is that all the money that we give to those people? Like the ones in specific is the Clarence Street Trust. I had an idea that we gave them money um, for earthquake strengthening or something like that. Is there anything... Is that the only money they get from Sean, Council? Uh, Sean is able to address, I guess, the current conversation. Uh, yes, if I can. The, um, well, some months ago now, the Council approved a um, unbudgeted amount of 150000 for Clarence Street Trust, but that was specifically for building works to yeah. bring part of the building up to uh, earthquake standard. Um, that money has not actually yet been um, paid out by Council. We're awaiting their um, invoices and evidence of, of having completed the work, but it's very different... Uh, category of yep. um, of grant, if you like, from council to community assistance. Presumably, the forty thousand is kind of an operating grant, whereas that's a um, okay. Uh, have they? Do you know if they've done the work, Sean? Uh, yes, my understanding is they've done the work. They just need to give us the paperwork. Okay. Are there other entities in there that also get other funding from council other than this? From the uh, community assistance perspective, we've got three grants. Uh, yep. So there is an event fund, a small community event fund that is opening in July, which some of these recipients may uh, apply to because of the community nature of their events. From a another granting perspective, uh, we don't give grants. Uh, there is historical things like the gift of deed to the One Victoria Trust, which when that lapsed, they moved into this multi-year grant funding. Same with Clarence Street Trust. Once they, the, the requirements around the gift of deed has passed and they've entered into this pot of money for ongoing operational. Okay, thank you. Okay, there are no other questions. Uh, we'll move to debate. Um, don't know if the mover wants to say anything. Anybody got any debate? No? Pretty straightforward. We'll go to the voting then, please. There you go. The motion is carried unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, and that loop brings us to um, the last item. Which <laughs> oh. Okay, so we've got a mover, Councillor Casson, and a seconder, Councillor O'Leary, and we are going to largely take it as read. If you want to highlight any really important points, Calvin, please feel free to do so. Um, no, nothing, Madam Chair. I was take, be taken as read, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, are there any questions? Because it was a very um, easy to read, straightforward report. Sorry. Oh, hang on. I'll put it on board. Sorry, Councillor Tuman. Paragraph uh, number nine there, Calvin. The uh, assessment rating of 44% in 2017, I understood that was about 2013 we got that rating. Am I wrong, am I? No, that, that was... In 2014, we did, there was an um, internal self-assessment done, which came 75%. Right. When I took over, the first thing I did was to get an external... Um, consultant and uh, Ministry of Civil Defence and to do an external assessment which would become our baseline. Uh, and so that 44 was our first rating. I can advise on that that overnight I did receive the first draft of the 2018 uh, capability assessment which is indicating we've transitioned from 44 to 56 per cent and some of their accompanying commentary was that it was a completely different capability to what was experienced 12 months ago. We can now have confidence that an effective response is conducted. There is no doubt the development and amount of work achieved to enhance HCC civil defence capability could not have been achieved outside of the, uh, the service level agreement arrangements. So we're just getting better and better, aren't we? Well, that's what it was indicating. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. 
everyone. Um, we have a mover and a seconder. We um, will go to the vote if there is no debate. Sorry, yeah, Councillor O'Leary, debate, yes. Um, congratulate in a formal setting um, Calvin and the team for the uh, we some of us attended the civil defence with um, Mayor Andrew opening yesterday mm -hmm. something that Blair knows he's not here I have been very excited about for a very long time um, we lead New Zealand in the uh, most impressive and best civil defence unit in the country and I, it might be a bit but uh, that really uh, excites me. It excites me for a lot of reasons because we're the first and we're the leader um, and we have an amazing city. But also actually in our ability to be prepared should the worst happen. And I know that it's been a really long journey. We've gone from a very terrible report and um, you in a former life, Madam Chair, would, would know about that. The region... <laughs> ranked very, very poorly, and we have just, um, with the dedication of Calvin and the other staff involved, come such a long way, and I've been on this journey right from the start, as I know um, Councillor Tooman and Kirsten has with um, us being on a former committee. So I'm very excited about that. The next phase for me is uh, telling the story of this to the community and bringing them on side. Um, and I hope, as was expressed by... Uh, the chair of the group, um, Hugh Verco, yes, uh, that we never, and, and I think Mayor Andrew mentioned it as well, that we never have to use that capability in, in our city. But congratulations, it was a brilliant day, and I've been waiting for it for a really long time. Mm, thank you. Yes, thank you for that. And I was just really disappointed I couldn't make it because I couldn't lift, lift my head off the pillow, let alone put it left or right yesterday, unfortunately. Um, um, yeah, and you're right, uh, Councillor O'Leary, uh, that it's been a long time in the percolation. There's been some really good Waikato regional staff behind this as well, especially across the communications uh, space. And so I think pulling together with the Waikato Regional Council has produced a good result. Thank you, Councillor Bunting. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd echo those comments. And while my journey hasn't been as long as, as other councillors around the table, uh, I too have been on this journey since my whole career in politics. Um, <laughs> But, um, but I'm uh, really excited about it, and um, we, Gary and I, went down after, uh, after the meeting the other day as, as a race, and um, we had a, a great tour of the, uh, of the place. Uh, they even put on a real live Police 107 show for us through the cameras. It was unbelievable to watch these guys in action. They saw some people doing some, uh, well, debatably an antisocial um, act um, on a building, and um, in the time that we were there, called the police. The police took these people away right in front of our very eyes, and that wouldn't have happened uh, unless unless these people had been on, on guard. And you know, while there are a ton of comments flying around about that incident, it was um, no, it wasn't staged. There was no screen coming thing coming underneath it. It might as well have been though, because it was a tremendous script. Um, but I could see these guys in action, all this team in action, um, and on something really minor. What excited a uh, excited me a lot in there was that um, for the entire time we were there, we were told how how safe this was from an earthquake, and I actually found myself, I don't know about you guys, when you went down that other day, um, wondering if you could feel an earthquake, because it was so incredibly, uh, don't worry, I'm going on, it was great, well done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, we'll go to the vote. Oh, sorry, Councillor Gallagher. Dave Mack and I had our apologies, and we were doing very good work in Wellington. Okie doke. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll go to the vote. The motion is carried unanimously. Thank you. Councillors will be back at half past one for the workshop. In committee room one. In committee room one.